much for being here this morning for what should be a really interesting and important conversation that we have. And we thank especially our, our panelists that are here before us and for your submitted testimony, for your own testimony that you'll deliver. And Max, thank you most sincerely for, for hosting us here. This is just a great and an appropriate venue, and we, we thank you for all the courtesies extended uh, to the commission. Uh, but today, um, my name is Mark Heron, and with Deborah Wada, I serve as the Vice Chair of the Commission. I'll be presiding at, at uh, today's uh, sessions, and we have important conversations that we want to discuss in terms of the current civil service personnel systems. Uh, our distinguished panel uh, will address the challenges with the current hiring processes and discuss options, uh, ultimately our goals, to how do we bring the next generation of talented Americans uh, to public service. And for clarification, this, this hearing is primarily focused on the hiring processes. This afternoon, uh, which I hope you'll join us for, we'll focus on how we can both attract and retain uh, public service employees with critical and needed skills. Our work uh, at the Commission defines public service as civilian employment in federal, state, tribal, or local governments. Uh, in a field in which the nation uh, and the public have critical needs. Last week was Public Service Recognition Week, and so our hearings today are timely and take place here at the Partnership for Public Service. And so it's appropriate for all of us and on behalf of the Commission to acknowledge the hard work and the dedication of government employees who serve with their fellow Americans, our communities, uh, and our nation. Civil so servants across the nation are working tirelessly and admirably each day to deliver government services to the public, some in the public side, most uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and so we thank and honor them for their service. Throughout the past year, the Commission has traveled the country to listen and to learn about ways to encourage and to inspire more Americans to serve. And when it involves public service, candidly, uh, we heard how recruiting and hiring practices are significantly out of touch with the realities of the modern workforce and effectively insufficient uh, to meet personnel needs. We heard that the federal hiring processes are far too slow and that USA Jobs virtually does not meet anyone's needs. So these are notable barriers uh, for entry-level candidates and a significant deterrent to mid-level career individuals who might otherwise be seeking employment at another federal agency. And to take that even further, for those of us in higher education, uh, we also heard that young people are not well represented in uh, public service and the federal service in particular. Americans under the age of 35 make up 35% of the workforce. Uh, but only 17% of federal civilian employees. <coughs> so whether prepared or not to, to, for the federal government, generational change is coming. 30% of civil servants, uh, including a majority of the senior federal executives, will be eligible to retire in the next five years, a significant cohort. Uh, for those who aspire to join uh, the public service, civil service, Making it through this hiring gauntlet is a noteworthy achievement on its own. Compounded, the lack of awareness and access present significant barriers to joining public service for even uh, the most talented American workers, those who seek this, this career. So the goal of this morning's session is to hear from experts uh, in our distinguished panel on how to ensure the current hiring processes are the best that they can be, so that these talented Americans can serve as civil servants. This will include discussing how ways to improve competitive and non-competitive hiring processes, modernize civil service hiring preferences, and work to build a, a pipeline, a workforce pipeline, from higher education to public service. So, we are looking forward and we hope our panelists will address these issues as directly as possible in their oral statements and their responses to our to the commissioner's questions. So let
let me welcome officially our, our panelists here. Melissa Bryant is the Chief Policy Officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Kimberly Holden is the Deputy Associate Director of Employee Services and Talent Acquisition and Workforce Shaping, quite a title, um, at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Thank you. Uh, for joining us, Brett Hunt is the Executive Director of the Public Service Academy at Arizona State University, traveling and being with us here. Jackie Simon is Public Policy Director for the American Federation of Government Employees. Welcome and thank you. And next, our, our host and President and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me go through some housekeeping matters. Uh, First, be sure to silence any electronic devices. I should take my own advice here. Um, and we'll now explain uh, some of the protocols and procedures for today's hearings. We have all received, commissioners have all received your written testimony and have reviewed it. We thank you for that. And it will be entered into the public official record. So what we ask today is that you summarize the highlights of your testimony in the allotted uh, five minutes that we have. Before you, right there, in front of you, Kimberly, we have our timing system. So when the light turns yellow, you will have approximately one minute remaining. And when it turns red, uh, your time has expired. Uh, so after all the testimony is completed, we'll move to questioners, questions uh, from the commissioners. And each commissioner will be given five minutes to ask questions and to receive uh, a response. In fact, we will go through one and possibly two, and perhaps a, a lightning round of three, depending on both the brevity of your answers or the brevity of our commissioner's questions. I cannot guarantee the latter, but <laughs> we'll do our best. Uh, and then upon completion of the commissioner's questions, we'll provide an opportunity for members of the public who are in attendance to offer comments either on specific topics addressed today or more generally on commissioner's uh, overarching mandate. We have done this in all our hearings. It's been extremely important, both for the input that we've received on our, our, on our commission travels. These comments will be limited to two minutes. Similarly, the light will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining and red when the time has expired. So with that, as preface and uh, gratitude for all of your participation, we're now ready to begin with our panelists' testimony. And I'd like to begin with Melissa Bryant, is the chief, as I said, the chief policy officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. And Ms. Bryan, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Members of the Commission on Military National Public Service, on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAVA, and our more than 425,000 members nationwide, worldwide, thank you for the opportunity to share our views, data, and experiences on the matter of improving basic hiring processes within the federal government. And as an organization that represents service members in the active duty, the reserve, guard, uh, as well as many veterans who have transitioned from the military to civil service, we appreciate this opportunity to address challenges within current civil service personnel systems and to discuss options to bring the next greatest generation into public service. I'm here today not only as IABA's Chief Policy Officer, but also as a former Army Captain and Combat Veteran of Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was a military intelligence officer who led men and women in combat, and upon my honorable discharge from the military, I felt it natural to continue my career as an intelligence officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency, where I became a recognized expert in partner engagement. I forged successful interagency collaborations with counterparts to develop multinational policy, I've also spearheaded work with the diverse teams of the U.S. and foreign partners to capture lessons learned from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan and replicate best practices. And I believe that my story is one as a successful transition from the military into the civil service and beyond, which is what landed me here today through IABA to testify before you. But this is often not the case for our nation's veterans. Veteran and military family stability, transition, and employment are an incredibly important part of IABA's work. It's a key policy area included in our policy agenda for the 116th Congress. And when service members transition out of the military, most struggle with pairing military skills to related civilian careers with transferring military licensure and formal credentials into the civilian world. 
Because of this, many veterans report that potential employers do not understand the value that they bring to their companies and organizations. Veteran unemployment, under, excuse me, underemployment was recently well above the national average. And while it's dropped, there are still significant challenges about long-term career success and underemployment in the veteran population. According to IVA's latest member survey, of which you can find on our uh, website here, we have uh, survey members of the post 11 generation where 37% of respondents felt underemployed. The ability to translate military skills for civilian use is the third most important factor behind salary and finding meaning in their work that our members look at when they were job hunting. It is in the country's best interest to better allow for what IEDA calls the next greatest generation to continue to serve this country in the civil service. Veteran and military spouses who have jobs in their preferred career field do better work and remain in those jobs for much longer. In talking about veterans in the federal workforce, according to the Department of Labor, as of 2018, post-11 veterans are twice as likely to work in the public sector compared to their civilian counterparts. 26% and 13% respectively. Among the employed, 14% of the post-11 veterans work for the federal government, compared with just 2% of non-veterans according to Bureau of Labor Statistics. Veterans now represent approximately one-third, 31.1% of the total U.S. federal workforce, marking a 5% percentage point raise since the Higher Vets Initiative was implemented in 2009. In addition to the Higher Vets Initiative, the Department of Veterans Affairs and Labor have created the Veterans Employment Toolkit and Veteran Hiring Toolkit, respectively, to aid employers in hiring and retaining veteran employees. Many veterans with a service-connected disability work in the public sector. As of August of 2018, 32% of employed veterans with a disability work in federal, state, or local government, compared with 18% of veterans with no disability and 13% of non-veterans. It's an incredibly important figure as 18 years of war have left many veterans with injuries related to their combat service. Employment is a meaningful and valuable tool in reintegrating the civilian world into the civilian world and can give soldiers, Marines, airmen and soldiers, and sailors, excuse me, a sense of purpose after taking off the uniform. Ensuring that all veterans, including those with significant injuries of war, are able to live a full life must include discussion around employment the fact that so many disabled veterans have a pathway to livelihood through federal employment is key to ensuring the long-term success of all veterans. Within the testimony, I have a chart on the total onboarding of veterans, and while the majority of us are within DOD and VA, we are represented across the agencies, and we have many ideas that are contained within our policy agenda that I'm sure we'll talk about within the Q&A, in which we believe that we can bring more veterans into public service and not just into DOD and VA. That's the natural fit. The gist of what we see from IMBA is that we need to be able to transfer people from federal, excuse me, from military service over to federal service by streamlining USA jobs, by being able to modernize and recruit application processes, and we also need to be able to allow for the transition assistance program to uh, perform by DOD to be able to allow for more veterans to come from the military into civilian service. That I look forward to answering your questions and sharing more of our views. Thank you very much, Ms. Bryan. Uh, Ms. Holden, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the Office of Personal Management's role in the federal hiring process to support agencies in building the federal workforce of today, of tomorrow. As the Deputy Associate Director for Talent Acquisition and Workforce Shaping at the OPM, I do appreciate the opportunity to give you an overview of the efforts that we are taking to ensure that the federal government's hiring process is agile and builds the workforce that reflects the public that we serve. The American people expect and deserve the best service from the federal government. This requires a talented, highly skilled federal workforce that is drawn from the rich diversity of the people that we serve. The federal government is a unique, has a unique opportunity to attract talented individuals from multiple sectors to work on a variety of compelling missions. However, too often implementation challenges and myths related to the hiring process get in the way of bringing on top talent and advancing skilled employees. The President's management agenda sets forth a long-term vision for effective government on behalf of the American people. It identifies a workforce for the 21st century 
as a key driver of transformation with particular emphasis on implementing targeted, implementing targeted people strategies focused on maximizing employee engagement and performance, reskilling and deploying, redeploying human capital resources to align with evolving mission needs, and enabling simple and strategic hiring practices to attract top talent and keep pace with the current change. Each agency is responsible for identifying, defining, and executing its own mission. This process includes determining the size of their workforce necessary to complete goals, balancing it in as restrained budgetary environment with critical aims of the agency, understanding responsible workforce allocations in order to identify populations of prospective employees in a given region, and working with existing employees in order to understand their needs and their motivations for remaining uh, on the job. OPM recognizes these responsibilities are challenging, and as such, we have taken continual action to be, to be able to assist agencies in building that federal workforce in a way that is fair, open, and equitable. The most common hiring barrier cited is the time that it takes to hire a new employee. OPM acknowledges this and continues to work with agencies to focus on improving agency execution on the hiring process with particular emphasis on shortening the time required to hire and reducing the burden on applicants. However, we also recognize that the time to hire is not a perfect measure for success. We must also look at the quality of the hire and whether those hired have the skill sets that are fully aligned with the agency's current and projected mission needs. Past efforts have focused on reducing the time with concerted effort on attention to agencies were able to be able to demonstrate significant improvements with the speed of hiring informed by various data sources such as management satisfaction surveys with management satisfaction surveys um, and data sources such as to that talk about the quality of referred job applicants. OPM has also led efforts to drive broader improvements to, quali to the quality of hiring. We continue to focus on these efforts and putting tools in place to enable the human resources professionals and hiring managers to achieve these multi-dimensional goals and further the administration's goals of reducing the burdens in the hiring process. Proactive measures have included uh, investing in tools and technology to support hiring, such as more robust applicants assessment tools, developing technology for wizard-based um, systems for hiring managers, and also tra institutionalizing training for our human resources professionals and empowering hiring managers to actively participate in the process. OPM continually encourages agencies to spotlight the value that they place on diversity and inclusion as well in the workplace. OPM is also working with agencies to examine their existing programs that raise awareness on retention tools. OPM realizes, OPM also continues to work to improve the applicant experience. We understand the nature and concern for both applicants and Congress on the lengthy job application on USA Jobs. OPM regularly makes improvements to USA Jobs as we receive feedback from, from stakeholders which are guided by our customer feedback. We have invested in improving the design, features, and tools that make USA Jobs more user-friendly. Forward-thinking change is also what drove the creation of the Pathways Program, which has been in existence for over seven years, provide, that provides an opportunity for students and recent graduates to begin their federal careers upon graduation. Recent research tells us that students and recent graduates are about to enter the workforce believe, that public, believe in public service and they want to make a difference. We continue to establish and improve relationships with educational uh, and academia institutions in order to provide more information. Through some of the examples that I've been able to outline above, as well as through the work that OPM does every day, we take great steps to assist the federal government in recruiting and retaining this workforce. And I look forward to answering any questions that the commission may have today. Thank you, Ms. Vice Chairs Guerin and Wada, uh, distinguished members of the Commission, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today about a, an issue of great national importance. My name is Brett Hunt, and I lead the Public Service Academy at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. Almost four years ago, we launched uh, this bold initiative at ASU, and I'm happy to say that 11 days ago, we graduated our very first class. The Public Service Academy at ASU has the goal of engaging more young Americans in consequential service to the nation. In short, the Public Service Academy aims to train the leaders we need for the challenges that we face. 
Our goal is to build a model for an academy, like the military service academies and or ROTC, that would train the next generation of public service leaders. I want to be very clear right up front what this could look like at scale. We envision public service academies at public institutions in each state training thousands of future military officers and public servants annually at the undergraduate level. The military officers coming from the existing program uh, of ROTC and the civilian public servants coming from what we have coined at Arizona State University and what we're doing on the ground at ASU called the Next Generation Service Corps. We envision that the academy could respond as needed to the training needs of the country and of the government workforce. For example, we'll be launching a new component called the Emergency Management Corps in the fall of 2019. The goal of the Emergency Management Corps is to train undergraduates, regardless of their major, with the skills necessary to uh, go into a career of emergency management at the local, state, or federal level. Uh, again, to repeat, in short, the Public Service Academy will train the leaders we need for the challenges that we face as a nation, expanding and contracting to the needs of the government workforce and the nation. In terms of recommendations specific to the Public Service Academy, and this is in my written testimony, I humbly offer the following. First, enable ROTC to function seamlessly with their civilian counterparts and the civilian component of the Public Service Academy in order to truly bridge the civilian military gap. Second, create more routes to national service through the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, and fellowships as well as a hiring incentive for Public Service Academy graduates. Third, and most importantly, enable the expansion of Public Service Academies through some form of federal support. Now, as context, I want to illuminate what we've learned on the ground about the next generation of our nation's leaders over the past four years. While many believe that this generation of young Americans are focused on their phones and social media more than the common good of their community or nation, we have found this assertion to not be correct. Annually, we bring in a diverse group of students from over 152 different academic majors who have a mission of serving something larger than themselves. They're sophisticated, informed, and qualified. In my humble opinion, far more than many generations before. Now, it's true that they do not see service as a domain only inhabited by local, state, or federal government. They see service as working in a nonprofit, starting their own socially minded entity, or working in the private sector and leveraging the resources of the private sector to benefit the common good. What I see in our students, and this is almost the most important, but we, what we've learned on the ground, is they want to solve problems. That's what motivates them, is solving problems. They want to confront issues on a very localized level, whether that's something truly local, like neighbors experiencing homelessness, or something more broad, like human rights abuses. My assessment of this next generation of leaders is that they want to know how they can solve problems. If we can demonstrate that they can solve problems in a career in public service, then they're ready to make that commitment to public service. I see evidence of this in our graduates who passed up very attractive opportunities in the private sector. For example, to go into Teach for America because they're passionate about equal access to great education. Or a top astrophysics graduate who chose to start his professional career in the United States Army with a plan to then go over to NASA. Another top graduate of ours is going to work for the Arizona Department of Economic Security because in his internship in that organization, he saw that he could help real people on the ground in his own state. All of these emerging leaders are serving in different ways, but all of them are motivated by their ability to solve problems. In closing, I applaud this body for not meeting today's reality by creating an idealized version of the past, but rather by crafting a bold vision for the future. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Congratulations on graduation. Thank you. Thank you. Son. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Although this hearing is focused on hiring, and AFGE represents people who are already hired, we have a strong interest in competitive, merit-based hiring, not only because we are firm believers in good government and an apolitical civil service, but also because federal employees don't always spend their entire careers in the same job. They apply for promotions and lateral moves within and between agencies. As such, the mem our members are wary of many of the proposals you're considering. Our members rightly see direct hiring and non-competitive hiring as a means of evading veterans' preference and merit principles. We hear bitter complaints from managers and contractors that hiring and firing federal employees is too hard. 
They want something easy come, easy go, where their mistakes can be blamed on workers and systems, anything but their own failures to learn and utilize the immense authorities they currently have under the law to hire the most qualified and fire those who engage in misconduct or who fail to perform. I'd like to address a couple of the specific recommendations in the staff memorandum to you all that was provided to us. The first is the proposal to adopt a modified Title 38 system for healthcare providers that was recommended by the 2016 Commission on Care from the VA. Please note that this proposal came from a body whose majority wanted to dismantle and privatize the VA. Part of that plan was to impose a personnel system that would facilitate the failure of the VA in order to clear the path to privatization. VA employees vehemently opposed it because it eliminated many of their rights to collective bargaining and union representation, reduced the retirement and health care benefits, based pay and pay adjustments on subjective factors, and thereby opened the door to favoritism, corruption, and discrimination. In so doing, it would have removed any kind of effective check on VA mismanagement or corruption of the kind that led to the weightless scandal in Phoenix in 2014. No one should be fooled by assurances that this kind of plan upholds merit system, merit system principles. It does not. It may reflect current non-union private sector practice, but the federal government should never low it, lower its standards to that level. Please understand that the adoption of that proposal would make federal employment less attractive for healthcare employees, not more attractive. In addition, the elimination of rights and accountability for management would lead inevitably to lower quality health care in VA, DOD, the Indian Health Service, in federal prisons, or wherever else it might be applied. We also strongly oppose the proposal to create any kind of cafeteria type structure for employee benefits. The federal government should provide all its employees a comprehensive benefit package. No one should have to choose between health insurance and paid time off between paid parental leave and retirement income security, between disability insurance and dental insurance. Instead of either or, I urge the commission to recommend the addition of employer paid parental leave, as well as disability vision and dental insurance. That alone would do far more to improve hiring and make the federal government an attractive employer than all the various ideas for non-competitive hiring that you are considering. There are also numerous proposals to eliminate or vastly reduce the benefits available under FERS. The defined benefit component of FERS is extremely modest, but it's highly valued by federal employees and is a strong inducement to federal employment, both in terms of recruitment and retention. Following the private sector in the realm of retirement benefits, where less than half of workers have any kind of employment-based retirement system at all, and only half of those who do receive it get no employer subsidy is not only immoral, it contributes to what will be an enormous retirement income crisis in the future. People who retire from the federal employment should have a dignified retirement. Their defined benefit, a retirement income they'll never outlive, is crucial to that goal. Finally, the memorandum calls for a new government-wide personnel system. This is the wrong time for such a project. No one should trust the Trump administration with government-wide personnel reform. At the moment, federal employees are fighting a very lonely battle to defend a political civil service from corruption and politicization. We have an administration that's tried to all but eliminate union representation for federal employees. They keep trying to freeze pay and distort the measurement of the pay gap, cut retirement and health care benefits, and they're trying to drastically curtail due process rights. They want to contract out federal jobs and abolish OPM. They're refusing to hire much needed personnel, including physicians and nurses at VA medical facilities. And last but not least, they keep trying to politicize agencies through intimidation, questioning of political loyalties, quashing scientific findings, and forbidding federal employees from using certain technical words. Again, this is not the administration to trust with government-wide personnel reform. This commission's work is extremely important. We know that years of politicians denigrating public employment and the mission of government has taken its toll. Failures by federal agencies are hyped as evidence that the government itself can do nothing right, even when identical failures by private entities are understood as the result of inadvertent mistakes or the actions of a few bad apples. Let's not succumb to the simplistic notion that the structure and rules that guarantee an apolitical, professional civil service are what stands in the way of more effective government. Let's acknowledge that difficulties in recruitment and retention are the result of low pay, low public regard, and an enormous workload due to understaffing and too few resources. This concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, hey. 
Thank you very much uh, to all of you for the extraordinary work the public service you are doing in this commission. I can't see the light, so that I assume that I have plenty of time here. <laughs> I got, I'm going to do this uh, 10 ideas in five minutes. We can. Little, <laughs> there we go. So 10 ideas in a little under five minutes. Number one, you, if you saw, uh, if you thought about the system that we have today, to me the most important difference between a well-run organization and what we have in the government is that the leaders in government, in the executive branch, and in Congress don't fundamentally see as one of their primary responsibilities the health of the organizations they're responsible for. And talent is one of the most important ingredients for the health of any knowledge-based organization today. So I think any set of ideas you have have to get at the question of how do you promote ownership and the leadership group around talent and management of the government. Number two, this is focused on the hiring process. We really need two things. We need to simplify it and we need to normalize it. The reality is that the talent market is expecting a different set of experiences than they're receiving and dealing with the government, and that has to change. There are certain specific needs that the government has, the question of politicization, that are unique, and those can be accounted for in ways that don't require the ornate, difficult, long process that exists today. Number three, the most important way you're going to address getting entry talent coming in is to, again, do what every other organization outside the federal government does, and that is use student internships as their primary mechanism for generating entry-level talent. Most important because it gives you the best way of assessing your talent. By and large in the federal government, student interns programs are friends and family programs. They're not seen as a critical part of the talent pipeline coming in. Number four, agencies absolutely need to build better relationships with the talent providers at colleges and universities. We have to understand that historically public service was seen as being government service, and today it's not seen as being government service at all. And what we need are universities stepping up to the plate, understanding that public service does have a broader a set of opportunities for people, nonprofits, your partnership and example of one of them, but in order for people to go into government, it will require universities to invest more heavily in educating their students about those opportunities than they would have otherwise. It's, uh, my metaphor is if you have a left hook when you bowl, you gotta take a step over. You gotta accommodate for the propensities that exist. And in today's talent market, they know nothing about it. You have to educate them for more. Number five, we need to create additional cha channels into government. The reality is that most talent today doesn't envision themselves going for a career in any organization or institution. Some may very well do that, but we need to see a better flow of talent between sectors. We need to see opportunities that are shorter term, the United States Digital Service is an example of what the last administration did. Cyber Talent Initiative is something that we are launching, which is for the entry side, which is akin to that two-year fellowship into government for, uh, uh, for cyber. We think those kinds of things are really important, as are uh, public-private uh, exchanges, uh, and we need to see a passport. So right now the law allows someone who's a federal employee to go out uh, and get experience in the private sector, come back at the same level they left at, rather than the level at which they should be given the additional experience. That ought to change. Number six, we need a pay system reform. Reality today is that we have a pay system from 1949 designed when we had a clerical workforce. The, market, the pay system is not market sensitive, it needs to be. That's the way you're gonna be able to compete effectively for talent. Number seven, we need to improve the federal workforce experience. I know this is hiring process uh, focus, but it's the same thing. Recruiting and retention are two sides of the, of the same coin. We need to make sure that the experience of federal employees is better. Half the attrition that occurs today occurs within the first two years that people are in the federal government. We need to create a culture of recognition. Only half of employees believe their good work is recognized today. Uh, we need to invest in the development of employees. More often than not, talent wants to see how they can make a difference and that they can make a difference for themselves and their skills and capabilities. Uh, military does a much better job. They see talent as an asset. The civilian side talent is viewed as a cost. Uh, and we need to provide public servants with the tools uh, that they expect. Their Sunday technology can't be different from their Monday technology. Number eight, we need to end shutdowns and crisis budgeting. No organization can actually work effectively when it has no idea what its resources are, uh, and no one's gonna stick around if they can't, if they're mission driven, if they're told they can't do their job because they're shut out of their job, that's a killer. So that has to end and change. That's really Congress's responsibility and it's a big deal and it's fundamental to hiring as well. Number nine, we need to address these issues collectively, by and large in government. Everything should ha that should happen is happening in some place, not in very many places. We need to see this as an enterprise effort, especially when it deals with talent acquisition. And last, we need to improve the brand of government. Uh, Axios just did a, uh, uh, a, a survey of under whatever brands, government bought them. 
Uh, and that has to change. Part of it's going to be actually allowing government to invest in, in, in making the case for why service is a good thing. There we go. Well done, Mark. On time. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I'll very much appreciate it. Thank you. So we now um, turn to an opportunity for Commissioner uh, questions. Each commissioner certainly will have uh, five minutes to, to uh, question our, our witnesses. And, and I will begin. Um, perhaps Ms. Holden, we could have a conversation. Your testimony is appreciated in your expertise in these matters is, is well known for its dazzling comprehensiveness, so we appreciate that. One of the issues that comes up frequently is that agencies must use uh, competitive exam for, for new positions. Uh, and yet, what has been observed to us is how that is failing. I would be interested in what actions or recommendations you would commend to us as we formulate our recommendations to the Congress and the President next year. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Um, the agencies actually have the ability, I mean, competitive examining is the, the main route in which we would like to see agencies recruit their talent and hire their talent. But they also have other options that are available to them to include recruiting from internally within their own workforce they can utilize, um, uh, excuse me, they can utilize the competitive service, they can utilize um, non-competitive appointments such as uh, for 30% disabled veterans, military spouses. They do have a wide variety of options available to them. Uh, and when they when they actually recruit, they can recruit in that way to open up the, the occupations or their, their openings to the, to the general public, which would give them the group of all of those different types of applicants to include persons with disabilities. Um, it is complex, and uh, it is the, we understand that the system is not flexible, but it is rooted in the foundation uh, with regard to the merit system principles and making sure that we do have a fair and open uh, competitive process. Uh, some of the um, improvements that I think uh, could possibly be made, which are some of the things that OPM is currently working on, uh, we do have a, a list of um, legislative proposals that have been made public that are, that are going through the process, one of which uh, Mr. Steyer has already mentioned uh, with regard to the talent that has left the federal government that may go into the private sector and when they come, when they're able to be reinstated, they can be reinstated at a, at a grade uh, that they currently qualify for under, in the competitive process versus the grade that they were when they left. And so that allows us to to bring that rich talent back and utilize them for other other types of positions across you know, that are needed in the federal government. Um, and making sure that we have a flexible system uh, that addresses the needs of, of the current workforce. We have, no one wants to come in anymore and work a 35 year career that I have when I came in at 17 years old. That's not something that, that applicants are looking for today. Uh, and we know that we also need to make improvements and we are making necessary improvements to the USA jobs which is the face of, um, of the federal government as far as hiring is concerned. So we're making those changes necessary so that applicants understand if I'm a student, then I should be looking at pathways or looking at internships. If I'm an internal candidate, I should be looking for, at open opportunities and looking at detail opportunities. So we have created these streams uh, so, that they, so that applicants understand the ways in which they should come into government. Um, and I hope I've, I've, I've answered your question. So but other are panelists want to reflect on this question? Of uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I would just say that you know our, our organization we represent about, about seven hundred thousand federal employees, and um, you know we often hear that uh, today's uh, entry level employees or applicants for jobs aren't interested in career employee employment anymore. That was what their parents were interested in. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the kinds of proposals that are the most discouraging and sort of, uh, inspire the most outrage and anger from our membership are, for example, one of the elements of the president's management agenda to create, um, uh, um, to turn basically most federal employees into term or temps um, who will be used for a few years and then uh, you know, used and abused and discarded and replaced. Uh, this idea of gig employment in the federal government 
Um, I think it's it's probably the worst idea that's that's come up, and um, for a lot of reasons. Among them, uh, it, it divests agencies of uh, the kind of institutional capacity and memory that is really necessary for a, a, an era like the one we're in, where every institution of our democracy and our government is under such severe attack. Um, it's, it's, thank God, we have career civil servants who are apolitical and devoted to the mission of their agencies, despite the continual attacks that they're under. And if, uh, if every uh, administration could replace the uh, workforce every four years, every seven years, uh, we'd be in a lot worse position. People still want career employment. Of course they do. They want stability, they want economic security, and they want fair pay. That's what they want. They don't want a, a short-term gig. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. The um, commission has gone out, and we've heard a lot from agency heads, actually individuals, uh, a lot about the um, veterans preference within the competitive examining and how that either the perception is that it prohibits them from being able to be considered, they don't understand the process, there's confusion. So I would, this is actually for all, I think, the panelists. I would imagine that you all have had some exposure to this. We're trying to get to what is what is really going on in terms of veterans preference. So if you, we can start with Ms. Bryant, if you should share with us. Sure, uh, veterans preference is a incredibly useful tool for veterans to transition over to uh, civil service, uh, just as I explained my own background. Mm -hmm. uh, we would like to actually see the expansion of the VRA from three years to 20 years, because that's something where if you go and use your GI Bill after your transition, maybe you don't want to still be the same person that you were when you were in the military, and you want to learn a new skill, a new trade. Uh, we found that there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, success with uh, using the apprenticeships and with using uh, other tools that are within the new GI Bill that allow for veterans to be able to make successful transitions. So we want to be able to allow time for that. Um, I have to respectfully disagree in terms of uh, the opinion of AFG in that it's not so much that the full-term employment, this is a part of also veterans preference too, and what we see in the trend lines of veterans who go to civil service, is that it's not that they don't want, uh, or that they, they necessarily want to be so, uh, career civil servants. What they want to see is that they're being treated as people and as talent. And I'll also respectfully uh, disagree with uh, uh, Mr. Steyer in that the military isn't always as great in talent management either. And that's kind of the bottom line, is that the veteran feeling is that we're disposable. And when you have leadership that reflect those kinds of feelings, that that's what you're seeing in trend lines of people People don't need bad jobs, they need bad bosses. And that's the challenge that you have within the military when we've been deployed and the quality of life has been upended. There's still uh, for our spouses, the same thing. And then when that goes into civil service, it's not that you're a term employer, a term employee, it's that you're not being fully utilized for your talent while you're there. So again, this is a leadership problem, not so much the talent problem. But we need to keep the veteran's preference because that is something that is a valuable tool for us to be able to come into civil service because it's not always exactly translatable from your military skills to your civilian skill set. Some of, some, well, we have heard some that would say that um, in some cases because we are, the way that the current process is structured, we may be putting veterans in a, a, a position that they might not necessarily be highly qualified for, and it may not be in their best interest in terms of long-term success. Mm -hmm. um, that because of the preference they got there, they don't have the necessary the skill level that's needed for success in that job. Do you think that that is true, or do you think that that's just a urban legend? I wouldn't say it's an urban legend. I'd say that that's something I've seen across the entire civil service. We're seeing people who were uh, not as competent or up to task to take their jobs. And then also I'll say very candidly that we've also seen what uh, we colloquially call in DOD the No Colonel Left Behind program, where you transfer immediately from taking off the uniform because you were a senior officer and then you came over to a GS-15 job that maybe you don't have the experience for simply because you came from the military. There's still cultural changes that you need to adapt to. So um, it's not a panacea. 
mean, any remedy for that. There is no panacea for that. I think that you're going to have a few bad apples no matter where you go and no matter how they came into the government agency. Does anyone else have? Yes, uh, I'd actually like to, to comment. Thank you for that question. Uh, it is a question that we get in a complaint that we get uh, that we hear from agencies across the board with regard to veterans' preference and even the comment about uh, veterans not being highly qualified for the positions that they may apply for. Uh, one of the things that OPM stresses highly for agencies and what agencies are actually required to do is make sure that they have a means to assess their applicants. And assessment has to go beyond the self ready occupational questionnaire. Uh, where everyone can, can check E or D to say that they're an expert in everything uh, just to get their foot in the door to get an interview. Um, what we have found is uh, that the use of an effective uh, validated assessment tool will help agencies and help hiring managers to be able to identify those highly qualified candidates and an assessment tool that, that gets to um, their actual skills and sometimes it can be a proctor written, a proctor uh, writing sample. It can be, we have uh, OPM has established assessments called from USA Hire that actually are occupation based. Uh, and then so that way, once an applicant meets minimum qualifications, then they take this, the next step is to take this assessment battery uh, that will actually bring the most highly qualified people up to the top. We value the, the, the skills and the experience that veterans bring to the federal government. And we know that you know, from what they learned in the military and transitioning, that, that they have, we have some very highly effective and highly qualified veterans. But we want to make sure across the board, our responsibility is to make sure that every candidate that comes into the government is qualified. And so that way, putting processes in place in order to determine effective qualifications and skills are things that we need to do. So in, in addition to the assessments, the stress of the use of subject matter experts, working alongside with the human, with the HR professional, to determine if you're looking for um, a biomedical engineer, the, H, the, not, the normal HR specialist will not know what skills to look for, but if you have a biomedical engineer sitting next to you looking for the right skills, then those are the types of measures that agencies are putting in place to make sure that they are able to bring the most highly qualified candidates in. Um, I think veterans preference uh, is is a form of affirmative action and like affirmative action of all types it's going to be controversial and people will question uh, the capacity and quality of candidates who are beneficiaries of, of an affirmative action uh, principle whatever it may be i would just urge you to consider every one of the non-competitive uh, hiring proposals that, that's currently before you in that same frame. Um, we see these uh, preferences being given to uh, graduates of certain colleges where federal jobs are only advertised at one university or in one region. Um, and and uh, you know, a veteran who's, who is in a position that would, would like to apply for a, a, a lateral move can suddenly find that, that job already promised to somebody through the Pathways Program. And uh, so, the, so the college uh, degree from a particular institution trumped his or her military service. There's all kinds of special uh, hiring uh, preferences that are either proposed to be established or currently established. And I think that it's worthwhile for all of us to consider you know, what's, what's worthy of a preference, military service versus attendance at a particular university or having a, a, a particular kind of degree, I, I think it's very important to be very explicit about that because we're in each one of these non-competitive hiring proposals you're looking at, you're talking about giving preferences to one group. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is going to be uh, directed to, um, to uh, Mr. Steyer, Simon, and Ms. Holden, it's on the issue of effective methods of assessing employee applicant qualifications. What we've heard as we've traveled around for folks who have tried to, um, uh, who have interacted, for example, with the USA Jobs Program, um, that there's some significant um, issues in terms of how they can best represent the skills, the talent, the experience that they bring, and how to do it within the construct of, of the system as it's currently designed. 
I wonder, um, how can we encourage hiring managers to, in, uh, to, to incorporate the most effective methods to assess applicants? And is there an area of agreement between federal hiring managers on the one hand and the collective bargaining uh, organizations that represent the hardworking federal workforce on how to best assess those kind of um, applicant skills? May I start with you, Ms. Bolton? Sure. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, and back to my, um, my previous response, the best way to assess the qualifications, and there are some very common uh, promising practices that we encourage agencies to use. Number one, are uh, making sure that you have a job opportunity announcement that is very clear, concise, and clearly defines the type of skills that you're actually looking for, which can be defined in the specialized experience. Making sure that if you're going to use that occupational questionnaire where I have to self-rate myself, um, that the questions are clear. They're not just multiple choice, but they're detailed enough to determine my writing skills, my communication skills, um, my technical skills, but also use a validated, using another validated assessment tool. Um, and then also using subject matter experts and then using structured interviews to really drill down to determine the qualifications of the candidate but also making sure that you have a recruitment plan or outreach plan. Where are you going to find the candidates? Quite often we'll, we see that, that hiring managers um, will throw the, the announcement to their HR shop and say, please, hi, please advertise this for me with no input, no involvement. And to me, that is one of the, one of the most important um, responsibilities of a hiring manager is to be involved in the actual announcement and to be involved in the process. And through our through the work that OPM has done in 2016 with hiring excellence and promoting that, the collaboration with your HR specialist, knowing where your applicant pool will come from, and um, making sure that do you really need to cast such a wide net, which gets to um, Ms. Simon, Ms. Simon's concerns about the internal candidates. If you are looking for an industry economist and an industry economist will come from a wide sector, then you advertise that way. If you're looking for a program analyst to work on a particular project that would only be uh, structured or could only be found within the internal to that agency, then you can restrict your, your hiring. And so that I think that that would also relieve some of the frustration of applicants who think that agencies will post announcements just for the sake of seeing who, who all is out there when they really may not have the budget or the real intent to hire from, you know, from casting that. Thank you. By limited time, I'd like to go to Ms. Simon, give her an opportunity, please. Um, I don't want to evade your question, but uh, hiring is a, is a classic example of a management responsibility. Yes, it is. And our responsibility uh, is if the employee, uh, if there's no good evidence that the employee has, has failed to perform to defend that employee's job. Um, I think that the worst uh, way of hiding mistakes in hiring and uh, failures to do an adequate job in, in screening applicants to make sure that they're actually qualified is to take away any uh, rights employees have to defend their jobs or else have what's in effect a, a perpetual probation <coughs> period of, of three or four years when you turn everybody into a, a renewable term or temp employee, which is where I think this administration would like to take us. Uh, take away anybody's right to defend uh, their job, uh, to appeal uh, a firing or an adverse action, um, and, and thereby okay. cover up mistakes okay. in hiring. Um, Mr. Sire, just, just a few seconds that are left. Um, sure, I'm going to catch it real quickly to three things on the entry side. Yes, we'll come back to the, the student uh, internship. The best way to assess talent is to have an opportunity to work with someone over a period of time. And every other organization that works well, any place else, does that as their primary mechanism of getting entry talent. So that would be the first point that we need to see better assessment through actually using student interns on the entry side. Second point that Kim made, we have to have the norm be that hiring managers are involved directly, that they see that as their primary responsibility. You can't assess if you don't have the ability to know what good looks like. Those are the people that do. That isn't the norm. Number three, GAO is a very good model for how to do this right. One of the things that they do is they actually have their senior leaders responsible for recruiting. And not only are they assessed on how many people they get in, but how those people do while they're actually in the organization. So that responsibility actually is focused on the outcome that <coughs> is really great employees. 
expand and strengthen the pipeline to public service? Uh, thanks, sir, for the uh, question. There are multiple things already on the table which have been discussed by other uh, members of the panel. I believe, and of course we're doing the work on the ground at ASU, that having a cohort of students who are identified during their four years, or in the case of a transfer student, their two years at the university, who are that pipeline into public service, into federal service, is the most effective way to utilize resources to bring in a diverse population in public service. Because you have, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, an identified captive audience that can be trained to the standard necessary for public service in different agencies that is uh, pointed in that direction. I think it's a better use of resources uh, than going out and trying to do it more diffuse operation where you have you know recruiters and other elements and of course that will always be necessary but the greatest use of your resources would be to have that population that's identified early one of the concepts that we've had with the public service academy at asu and we would uh, champion as it expands would to be actually as we're doing with the emergency management corps to have specific cohorts within the core that are training for specific federal service so the idea that, uh, to use the military example, if you are going into the Navy, uh, there's a point in your uh, third and fourth year of training where you identify you're gonna be surface warfare, uh, submarine, uh, aviation, et cetera, that there would be some type of element of that. You would have two years of your baseline training in the public service academy for civilian public service. And then in your final two years, you would specialize. And that could be, again, that could be uh, going into Department of Agriculture type uh, focus that could be going into international type programs in the Foreign Service, USAID, et cetera. And so uh, our opinion and what we've, again, seen from our work over the last four years is having that dedicated cohort driving in that direction is the most effective use of resources to serve <coughs> this. And uh, as I said in my, um, my oral uh, statement, the scale would be meeting much of what the federal government needs if you did scale this to other universities around the country. Just like land grant, and we just can look back at history and see some different ways that we've met the needs of the nation, the Public Service Academy could be the way that we meet much of that need. Excellent, thank you. And forgive me for not being familiar with the curriculum, uh, but uh, do you have, and this is kind of stimulated by uh, Mr. Steer's uh, comment about internship. Is it part of your curriculum to have a, an internship? Great, great question, sir. So within the Public Service Academy, there's different elements. There's ROTC, there is the Next Generation Service Corps. So to focus on the Next Generation Service Corps, which is what we've already stood up within the Public Service Academy, they're required to do internships in the public, private, and nonprofit sector. So even if you say, hey, Brad, I'm gonna go be an accountant for KPMG, that's great. We still want you to do an internship in the public sector uh, and the nonprofit sector, the goal of which is to develop an understanding of the decision-making, hierarchy, culture of the different types of organizations. And what we found through those internships, uh, oftentimes, again, uh, as, as uh, uh, Ms. Bryant said, uh, people leave uh, bad bosses, uh, not bad jobs. We see that folks get into organizations and uh, really like the culture of the organization, and it will often lead them towards uh, staying in that organization once they, once they graduate. As I give the example of our student who uh, is at the Department of Economic security at the state of Arizona. Not often think of, thought of as a, a young person as a really exciting place to go, but he found exciting work there because he got to do an internship there. Right. And uh, it's going to uh, do that as his first job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, do you okay? Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I echo my colleagues. Thanks to the panel this morning for sharing your time and your expertise um, with us. <clears throat> Mr. Steyer, you talked about as one of your 10 
um, goals. Um, you talked about internship, and we've talked about it a little bit. Um, my question is, from, from what we've, we've heard as we've gone and talked with um, folks across the country, is that some agencies use the internship program very well, some agencies don't use it very well, some agencies shy away from it altogether. So from your perspective, why are some agencies successful, some agencies not? And um, to, your, to your point of increasing the use of um, internships, what are the challenges that you see for, um, for increasing across the federal um, agencies using um, internships? Great, so thank you uh, uh, for, for the question because it, it seems like a very basic issue here and yet it's fundamental, I think, to the health of our government. And it represents, again, a process that pretty much every knowledge-based organization I'm familiar with uses. I think the barriers are in two different camps. The first, there are some structural barriers that can be addressed. For example, there are ways in which you convert interns into full-time employees if they are viewed as having been successful as interns but those conversion opportunities are limited or non-existent if those interns are hired by third parties, even if they're paid for by the government. So an organization like, like Haku, is, it's the panic, it's a, 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 a organization that really drives a lot of great talent bringing into government. They can't, when they bring an intern cohort into the government, when the government hires them to do this, those people are not actually eligible for conversion. And the second is that if they're volunteers, so if they're not being actually paid, and there's a good question about what opportunities, they also have more limited uh, conversion uh, uh, opportunities. So there are some rules that I think could be changed that would make it easier to do it. But more fundamentally, I think there's a cultural issue at stake here because um, today, agencies could do this, and as you know, there's a lot of unevenness, and yet they don't. And part of this is I think there isn't that leadership ownership, and there's not a drive uh, from the top to make this the norm. And any change is always difficult, and I think this becomes one of the clear opportunities for you here, where you can beat the drum about how this would be a way for you to improve the capability of our government to drive new talent into the government and allow the government to assess that talent more effectively by using a commonly available tool that everybody else does. I think part of it will require more transparency, so there's knowledge about what agencies are actually using this and using it effectively. So how, you know what you manage, you can't manage, we don't measure, but what you measure actually drives your management, so I think making sure that there's transparency and availability of information about what agencies are using internships, how many of them are using them to actually generate talent, how that talent is doing, those are kinds of things that if they were broadly available, I think they would drive change. Part of it will again be focusing on leaders seeing this as part and parcel of their core responsibilities. So um, to continue, those agencies that don't use in terms, is, right. that, is that because their leadership doesn't know about using interns or they've had a bad experience or they think it's too difficult, some of the challenges that you talked about early on? So when we talk leaders, I would bet that most leaders have no idea where their talent is coming from. There are very, I'm a, as my wife says, a fallen lawyer. Um, you know, the Department of Justice has their honors program, which is widely respected across you know, the legal profession. And yet, pretty much um, all agencies, all agencies have lawyers, and very few of them have robust programs like the Department of Justice does. Some of it, if you talk to people inside, will say it's a budgeting issue. They don't know what their long-term resources are. They're not sure how much commitment they can make to people a couple of years out. I don't think that that actually really explains the, 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 the full set of issues that are going on here. Um, I think, again, it's, it's, to me, a demonstration of the lack of prioritization and focus by leaders. And uh, so I think the way you're gonna have to change that is by setting an expectation uh, for those leaders to actually be focused on this as a particular issue and providing a method of transparency to see and accountability to see whether they're actually doing it. My experience has been when agencies have actually done this, that you can see a very large and big positive culture change in the organization. Unfortunately, there really aren't that many that, that do this. We struggle with even understanding who is using these authorities right now because it, that information is harder to come by than, than it ought to be. Thank you. 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 Thank you
you may have to add on to that just from the veteran perspective. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with Mr. Steyer's comments um, just to uh, give you a, a bit more illustration of where it works and doesn't work for veterans. Uh, within the VA, for example, they use the internship program and because you have military who are transitioning from a position, particularly within your medics and your corpsmen uh, who come in into those uh, health uh, care positions, they see a great uh, opportunity at least in coming in as interns and being able to come into the VA as civil servants, whereas in DOD, not only is it inertia, cultural issues, it's, uh, it's also classification or classified information rather than working and just uh, needing a clearance for many of the jobs there. That is an impediment to interns coming in in DOD. And so that could be something, especially for transition veterans, that would be great, especially if they held over their clearances coming over from the military if it's applicable. But uh, there needs to be agency focus on that. Thank you. Commissioner Casey. Thank you, and I also want to thank you all for your public service and for joining us today. I want to um, pick up uh, on what my colleague, Mr. Allen, asked uh, you, Mr. Hunt, and again, congratulations on your first you know, graduating class. That's really inspiring. In terms of encouraging more public service academies, I love the fact that you guys developed this at ASU, but didn't say we just want it, we want other people to replicate it. So I have, a, I guess, a two-part question. One is, uh, have you had other universities come, and is there interest in what does it cost, basically, to establish one of these at a university? I, I noticed in your testimony you said that you guys did this because you just believe in public service and you funded it all, but maybe there's a role for the federal government or state local governments to say, well, maybe we put up some matching funds or incentive program or startup program. So if a university wanted to start a public service academy and say have 500 students the way you did, what would that cost somebody? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Casey. We, so ASU chose to go out and do this because it's hard, right? <laughs> this has been talked about uh, since the establishment of West Point. There's also the idea that we should have an academy where we train the civil service, right? Um, and it hasn't happened because it's incredibly difficult. So we chose to go out and uh, upfront the difficult uh, elements, including the cost of, of launching this public service academy. Um, we have had interest from other universities, and uh, as I won't, won't name names, but we've had great interest from other universities. What the impediment is, is having this tied to something that is a path to a federal job, career, you know, then what? I was uh, an Army officer and ROTC cadet when I signed on the dotted line. I knew that uh, part of my commitment was uh, a job at the end of, of that, uh, at the end of that line once I finished my training. And so that was a great incentive for me to go into public service. So enabling the public service academy to one, be something that is a value add to a university, not something that is just taking resources from the university without a direct path for those graduates. Enabling that to happen on the federal level is key. I talked about it a little bit in my written testimony, uh, which is enabling ROTC to fully integrate and work with uh, the civilian students to meet that goal of bridging the civilian military gap. Enabling some type of funding mechanism on the federal level, of course, would be an incredible uh, way to unleash the potential that we have for the Public Service Academy. One of the things that has, uh, we've been asked before is this idea is there should there be a West Point, right? Somewhere here, and that of course has been talked about for many years, and many of you have been around the table on this. Um, I think it's a yes and. We can meet scale rapidly by doing this at state universities around the country. There also could be a federal academy here, somewhere proximate, where those folks are trained. Um, of course, it all comes back uh, to the money. Uh, at ASU, the way that we are doing it, I don't, have an, I don't have an exact number for you, but I'd be happy to get that, that back to you. Um, the way that we're doing it is leveraging every resource at the university. So, I run our organization, 556 students, with a staff of four today. The way that I do that is I leverage the university, the academic units of the university, in order to be able to go out and teach our, our courses. We're within the Watts College of Public Service Community Solutions. I utilize change makers, some of the Ashoka U uh, components at the university, in order for us to do our service. I leverage the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, which is a world-class veterans uh, student veterans center at ASU, in order to do service with our veterans uh, program, the Veterans Scholar Program. So I talk about our organization as uh, existing within an ecosystem where we leverage different components of the university in order to meet that mission. 
And that, in that, in doing that, we're able to do it in an incredibly thrifty way, if you will, because we're leveraging existing resources at the university. And so that would be the model that we want to export to other universities. You don't need to build, uh, you know, spend a uh, hundred million dollars building a new facility with ivory columns. Rather, you need to integrate this into the work that's going on at the university with a final end, which is a route into a career in public service. All right, so if I understand, thank you very much, Mr. Tom, if I understand correctly, there's both cost, but also if the federal government said, if you successfully graduate from a public service academy with, with a pathway towards federal service, you've actually taken courses, et cetera, prepare you, then we will guarantee you a job for Correct. two years or whatever. Correct. Great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Okay. Well, thank you all for being here today. And uh, Max, uh, thank you to you and your team for your generous hospitality. It's a beautiful facility. This is uh, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Hunt, I wanted to follow up on Mr. Casey's line of questioning, please. Um, with regard to the Public Service Academy, you, you outlined why the students are engaging in that and going into the program. For those students who are not uh, participating in the program, do you have an understanding as to why uh, they don't, uh, what objections or obstacles they have to it? And so just to understand your question, sir, so folks that are not choosing to enter our program Correct. or the average student at ASU? Correct. That's a tough question. Um, I, I, let me tell you about the students we do have in the program and maybe that will help eliminate this question. Um, the students who are coming in our program oftentimes are coming from uh, families of service. We have a high percentage of folks that come from our military dependents or parents have served at some point in the military. We have a lot of folks that come from a faith perspective who have done service growing up and it's part of part, part of who they are and they want to continue doing that. Uh, and we have quite a few people who I believe want a career in public service, but are not bound to the military and don't want to go into the military, right? Uh, and they see our organization as an opportunity to expose themselves to that. All of that is kind of within this group of everybody's a problem solver. Um, we have the mandate uh, from our, our president, uh, Dr. Michael Crow, to match the kind of the, the, what the university looks like within our program. So uh, I do have the students in my program who went to the right parochial school that have done incredible work and did you know, a summer project in Costa Rica. I also have students who are helping raise their siblings and who are getting younger siblings off to school in the morning and coming to the university and then going to work at Target in the evening. So we have that whole variety of students within our organization. And there's probably some students who would like to come in to the program, but they're being told by parents and influencers that the the reason for going to college is so that you can get a job in investment banking, make millions of dollars, or take care of your parents when you're out of school. What what's the value proposition to uh, those people who might offer resistance to students who want to come in? Developing as character-driven leaders with the courage to cross sectors, connect networks, and ignite action for the greater good. Let me unpack that. So that's how we. Uh, that's how we market this to folks coming into the organization, saying character-driven leaders are the ones that are gonna solve our most vexing problems uh, as a nation and, and internationally. And if you're among that group of folks who wanna come in and do that, and not necessarily in the public, private, or nonprofit sector, but rather as a character-driven leader on a trajectory to solve a problem that may take you into public service, and then may take you into a nonprofit, and then down the road may bring you back into an administration. We want to develop those character-driven leaders. Now, I understand you're at the beginning stages of this, but um, assuming it's going to be successful, and it will be, do you think there's a, an opportunity for something like this in community colleges or, or technical specialty schools? Yes, sir, and uh, I'll get on my, I'm getting on my soapbox here, so stop me uh, as, as I go along here. Um, yes, I believe there's, we talk about this, this pathway of service, right? There's a spectrum of service. Spectrum of services stop, starts when you're a young person. That may come from your parents, it may come from your church, it may come from Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a variety of organizations. We want to be the next step when people come to the university, whether they're going to the community college for two years, right? There should be an existing component there. And then coming to us, which we accept transfer students uh, for two years of the university. And then the question then, right, we can build that, is what do they do then, right? What's that next step? next step in the pathway of service. For some, it's gonna be the military. For some, it's gonna be public service. 
that's that spectrum of service that we see ourselves a key component of at the university level. Real quick, last question. Are you engaged at the uh, state and local level, partners at the state and local level? Uh, we are engaged at the state and local level through internships, uh, through uh, community impact labs where we actually work in the community on real projects. Uh, so yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, if I could just add Please. to that very quickly, um, I think there's some lessons learned from the military that you can draw to build upon with uh, Mr. Hunt's comments. One, DOD has influencers data from uh, from parents, from others who are within and being familiar with GMers, and so that's something where they've actually been able to drill down into what uh, it gives you the propensity mm -hmm. to serve. And a lot of times it's because of the community that we're in, just like I think within the military where uh, there's a recent Pew study from last year that speaks to we're increasingly a family business. We're increasingly coming from, I'm a third generation military officer, for example, and that same uh, type of uh, influence data tracks with what you see in public service as well. And so as you're speaking about the propensity to serve and why are more not involved, it's because it's something where it's almost ingrained into you from the point of childhood. And that's what DOD has learned in the military. And I think that's something also that can inform how do you change that within the public discussion for those who are not coming from uh, public service families. Thank you. Commissioner Skelton. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take the conversation maybe up a level from some of the specifics to uh, the character and the, the composition of the federal workforce. Um, I'm a big believer that the people that serve America probably best serve America when they look as much like America as possible. Um, you can call it diversity or what have you, um, and there's peer-reviewed science on how diversity matters inside of organizations and changes them for the better. Um, I'd like to start with you, Ms. Bryant. I'd like to see if I can make my way down uh, or ask several of you. Uh, I was struck in, um, in your testimony. I, I've heard it before. I struck 31% of the federal workforce are veterans, and immediately went, I don't know the number of veterans in the civilian workforce in relationship to that on the top of my head. It's about 8% of the people in America over the age of 18 are veterans. Mm -hmm. um, do veterans contribute to, how, what's your feelings on how veterans contribute to the diversity within the federal workforce, seeing as they make up so much of it disproportionate right. to society? I mean, diversity inclusion is something that uh, we very much promote within IABA and showing that the next greatest generation needs to be reflected by society. Women veterans, for example, are the fastest growing demographic within uh, our population. And so that's something that does get reflected as we transfer over into civil service because we do have the propensity to continue to serve. And that really is what is ingrained within uh, veterans who transition. Uh, but you do have a problem geographically. Just the Pew study I cited is exactly where it shows for DOD we have a problem. You're going to have the same problem in public service if you're leaning on veterans, and that is we're increasingly demographically from the Midwest and the Southeast, so there's propensity for groupthink and for cultural norms that are acceptable in those areas. They have a huge record, uh, recruiting problem within the military coming from the coast. Um, and to the degree in which some reportedly high schools don't let recruiters come in, we're, we're all about that. Um, and that's tomorrow. So yes, yes. And so I want to I want to take over for our, or uh, try to steal a funder from tomorrow's uh, hearing. But yes, you're going to see that same type of, um, uh, of that same type of demographic coming in from the military over to civil service, and that's the biggest challenge. And that's where there's a national level conversation that needs to take place on propensity to serve and why it's good to serve your country in any capacity. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip over quickly just to Mr. Hunt and Ms. Hill now. Uh, how, how does academia and college, public service academies, or just colleges and universities, how, help, could, how can they help ensure that the workforce looks like America? So by and large, especially if you take in the community college population, the transfer population at a, at a given university, uh, it's by and large a reflection of the state. And in the state of Arizona, Arizona State University, that is our goal, right, to reflect the state of Arizona. So if each unit, let's just say the public service academy, is reflecting that within their state, um, we can get to in the direction of solving for this, this problem. There's no uh, question, and, and uh, again, your uh, information on the peer review data uh, that uh, doesn't uh, endorse that the more diverse we are, the stronger we are as a unit, as a nation, uh, et cetera. And so uh, if each of those universities, which state universities by and large do, um, reflect uh, the diversity of their given state, I think we get in the direction of solving 
um, solving for this problem. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holton, how's the federal government doing? Um, well, I mean, I think that from the the request that we get from agencies, I mean, of course, you know, as Ms. Ryan said, 31 percent of the veterans of our of our civil service of the federal sector is veterans. Uh, but what we do find, uh, because of the demographics and where we see a large number of veterans coming from, the the agencies feel that there's a lack of diversity with regard to diversity of thought, as well as um, the, the makeup of the veterans that are coming into the workforce. A lot of them, a lot of agencies will come to us and, and make a request for direct hire for it because they know that, of course, that does not require them to hire veterans because they're looking for diverse candidates and not necessarily skills based, but the ones, people that can bring in. Uh, different sets of values and also different sets of um, diversity of thought because there are some workforces that all look alike, walk alike, and talk alike. And so they are looking for other ways to be able to enhance diversity and continue to go out to colleges and universities, to the Hispanic serving institutions, other minority serving institutions to see if they can recruit from those ranks to bring uh, the, the type of diversity that they need in their organization. So I think that overall you will, you will see that there is an issue. Um, and so because we have so many service members that are going back to school, getting degrees and coming into and transitioning into the federal service, I think that you will see from, from research that there is an issue, especially with the area of, of diversity of thought, and making sure that they have a, a widely diverse population. Thank you. I appreciate you adding that element. Great. Well, we have some uh, time also for a second round for our panel to, to take advantage of the expertise uh, of our panel. So thank you for, for that. Um, I would like to, Max, bring you into a conversation because Ms. Bryan gave us a good sound bite this morning when she said that uh, people don't make bad jobs, they leave bad bosses. And that's an issue to bosses up there. Um, and you also said that within two years, a substantial amount of federal workforce changes through attrition. Do you agree with that? What kind of recommendations would you have? I mean, part of it is if, if they run this gauntlet and actually get into the federal service, and then if, if there is this attrition issue, some natural, some perhaps a kind of training or sensitivity or that, that might lead people to leave, do you have some reflection on that? Absolutely, I always have reflections. Uh, on, on that particular question though, uh, to be very clear, it's half of the attrition that takes place occurs within the first two years. The government by and large has a lower attrition rate than other organizations and certainly large organizations outside of the, uh, the public sector. Um, no doubt, I think that's exactly spat on. People leave the, their bosses, they don't leave the organization. And I think one of the very important tools that we have in the federal government is a federal employee viewpoint survey. And so we have the voice of the employee, we have data that you can take down to essentially um, every equivalent of the top you know, senior executive service person. Um, it's not used as much as it ought to be as a management tool. Um, and what the data will tell you is that the by and large the federal government is a remarkable institution in the mission commitment of the people that are there. And so 95, 96% across the board will say, they'll go the extra mile to get the job done, and that's gonna be a good 14 plus points above what you'd see in the private sector. But on most everything else, you're not seeing numbers that are better than, we will, than the private sector. And it's largely around leadership. The most important factor where the government underperforms in is providing its workforce with uh, great leaders who are going to enable those people to do what they wanna do, which is to serve the public. And so, how do we change this? First of all, we use the data. And we make sure, again, back to the transparency point, uh, my view is you should be holding the senior leaders accountable for what that data says. Um, and that would be a very powerful driver in terms of ensuring that uh, you would have the right focus of leaders on, on providing opportunities for their workforce to get good work done. Uh, and you need to invest more. I mean, I take your point that no organization is terrific. I will tell you that, speaking in broad generalizations, that the military just invests more in leadership development. Sure. They see that in, in career progression, uh, and it's just, it, it, um, you know, you get good and bad in both places, but I think as a model, one of my favorite examples is when uh, you know, General Powell went over to State Department, you saw a very big change in their employee engagement numbers, and he began by investing in training and development of the workforce. So to the extent that you can press for 
that kind of investment in leadership development that you can press for management and uh, measurement tools that hold leaders accountable for those kinds of investments and payoffs, I think that kind of stuff will turn the ship around more than anything else. I think that actually is where the game's at. Ms. Simon, do you have any reflection on um, I, I think that uh, the importance of high quality managers who are trained uh, to to utilize all the flexibilities they have and to, in our case, uh, understand and respect the collective bargaining agreement um, goes a long, long way toward making um, a workplace where conflict, which is inevitable, can be resolved in a constructive way. And um, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but that's what's under attack right now. Uh, without the collective bargaining agreement, when conflict arises, uh, there's only one option. Uh, for the employee to leave. Uh, when you have a collective bargaining agreement that has a process for uh, a, a constructive resolution of a grievance, uh, then you have an opportunity not to lose your investment in employees who you, who've trained, who've been part of the organization, and you can move forward. But right now, it's uh, you're fired. Um, just like their boss became famous for that phrase, that seems to be the management philosophy uh, that we currently have with this administration. You know, my way or the highway. And that's certainly not a, a, a kind of management philosophy that uh, is gonna produce uh, high morale, high productivity, um, uh, uh, any kind of ability to retain uh, the higher quality. A little time left. Sure, I just wanna clarify my, my point <laughs> is that when I'm talking about talent, uh, particularly within the military, the military knows they have a problem with talent management. And that's not so much the leadership development, that's not ROTC, we're a leadership factory when it comes to that. But it's a matter of talent management once you grow beyond the entry level and you get to the mid-career level. And I'll be very frank, when you're someone like me, both in the military and at the Defense Intelligence Agency of the Pentagon, I left when I saw, well, I don't really see a pathway for me to continue to advance in a true meritocracy. And that's why you have an attrition rate, because you have people who are highly talented, I'm not being conceited and saying that, I'm speaking more broadly, but I'm saying that you have people who see, I have a career path, I could be someone who could be a senior executive, I could be someone who could be uh, going further beyond, but because of the inertia in the cultural uh, inertia, I should say, that's both in the military and also in the civil service, that's where you see people leave, is because there's a, a bottleneck of talent management and only the few are able to crack through that in order to be able to become a part of a true, what they feel is a true meritocracy. Thank you, Mr. Um, you know, we, when we've got across the country, we've, we've heard from young Americans, and obviously the, the ones that are propensed, that have been exposed to service in general, obviously have the wherewithal, the information from their parents, their immediate family members, to be able to navigate this system. But we heard from a lot of young Americans who have an interest because they do want to do something that solves a problem and they see the problems this country is facing. And yet they come to USA Jobs or they go to whatever agency that is closest to them and they try to navigate a system that they don't understand, that is not responsive, it's not transparent. And from what I'm hearing though is we've done these fixes where we think we've made a problem. So where's the disconnect? I'm trying to figure out where where should we fo I guess focus our attention to fix where this disconnect is between where the general public believes we are and where we as institutions believe we are. And I open this up for anybody on this panel to <laughs> take it take a shot at it. Ms. Holden. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your for your question. And um, it is one of the biggest challenges that we see. I mean, from OPM standpoint. We are out on the road educating, talking to students, talking to universities, working with career counselors to help them understand that there is a benefit for their students to come into the public sector. We want the talent, we need the talent, uh, just to make sure that we have the, the workforce for the future. I think the disconnect uh, could is also on some of the sides of the agencies. We have several agencies that do a phenomenal job that actually have people placed on campuses to talk to young people. Um, to help them understand the benefits of coming to their agency. But not, not all agencies are funded or resourced in the same way. And so not all agencies have the ability to have separate recruitment teams that do nothing but go out and talk about 
uh, the brand of the agency, the mission of the agency, and actually to go out and, and recruit and do the outreach for uh, for the for themselves. They rely heavily on their either on USA Jobs or they rely heavily on their internal agency websites um, to be able to go out, to just to, to, to take the place of actually going out and having a voice in the community. Uh, when I worked for the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA is in every single state, and we always promoted that we were in every single community and making sure that we had the actual employees and the workers out talking to colleges and, and doing the recruitment was very effective. And I think that that's the one thing uh, that's missing. OPM can do what we can do from a global standpoint, but there's also making sure that we have many agencies, many more agencies out there with us, making sure that we can promote uh, the impact of the federal that, that being in public service brings to any community and to any person. But does that mean that we need to look then at the structure of how, particularly at the entry level, how we um, structure how agencies recruit individuals so that it's a whole of government approach as opposed to relying on individual agencies based on their resources? Well, I mean, I think you know, we've given agencies an opportunity, we've given them a pathway through the Pathways Program, we've given them vehicles in which to hire entry-level talent. Uh, there are challenges with, as with any program, there are challenges with uh, that program. We have done a lot of work to make improvements to allow agencies to bring entry-level talent in. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's so there is a, a wholesale mechanism for agencies to bring in entry-level talent. It's just a matter of each agency being able to do their workforce planning, determining where they want their talent to come from. And if you if you have three GS-15 positions or 13 positions that become vacant, do you necessarily need to bring in that GS-13 or GS-15? Think about bringing in entry-level talent and do some workforce planning and start growing your talent internally. And those are some of the things that agencies have the ability to do and they're delegated to do that. And it's not necessarily coming upon OPM to do that for you. But I'm, and I know I only have a little time left, but because I'm trying to drill down into this problem because we hear it everywhere we go across this country and it's not changed. And so it's, um, so even in my previous job, the Pathways Program, that, the, the, whether it is true or not, is there data by agencies that we can point to, that we can put on a website that ha has some transparency to the American public of what is really going on so that we might be able to break down some of these, whether it's myth, whether, you know, it's uh, what they say is uh, there's always a grain of truth in every um, stereotype. Um, uh, how do we break this down so that people understand what truly is going on? Does the government collect that data that we can share? We do have data that we collect annually on um, on the use of the Pathways Program. Uh, we've also, OPM has also done a study of the Pathways Program, I believe it was 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, OPM actually did a study of the use of the Pathways Program and some of the best, and to highlight some of the best practices of agencies that are using the program and using it well. Um, I have to say that I believe that over the past few years, funding has probably been an issue, um, as well as um, just the, the, the shut development shutdown has also impacted some agencies' ability to, to bring in interns and bring in entry level, entry level talent. There are any number of factors uh, as to why agencies are not using, uh, using that program. I noticed that the data shows that the, the numbers of interns that are being hired has significantly decreased not only in, in the internship and recent grads program, but also the PMF program. We've noticed that all of those programs are de decreasing for some reason. And until we peel back the onion and, and figure out what the, the actual issues are and probably do some additional studying to look at the data, uh, we really need to be able to, to figure out what the issues are and why agencies are not using those programs effectively. Very quickly. I, I see some um, pent up demand here, <laughs> and I, I see the red light, but it's yeah. a very good conversation. So, do you want to continue into your third round of questions right now? So, oh. we'll reset the time, and this is effectively your third round. It's kind of cheating, but we're all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Please. All right, why don't we, yeah, let's keep this going. So, we'll redo the time, and then. My third round. Okay, uh, very quickly, 100% uh, agree with uh, uh, Ms. Holdman that. The sequestration and shutdowns have been problematic. Uh, but there's definitely been across the burden rather that DOD and VA especially felt for bringing on new talent. 
uh, on the VA side, it's why advocacy groups like IVA and others fought really hard to um, at least end the shutdown of 2013, which I was a gubby still at that time and lived through, um, and uh, you know, furloughing employees, but then also continuing to uh, operate under budget caps and sequestration is still harming your top uh, agencies are, uh, that are impacted, uh, or at least have veterans that are coming in as recruits. But to your point, again, I'll go back to talent management is really the problem. And for a lot of veterans, we're not coming in necessarily as entry level, we're coming in as mid-career. And so if you're coming in as mid-career, and many of us come in through competitively, even though we advocate for non-competitive means and for veterans' preferences, things like that, for your folks who have uh, a higher level of experience and are coming in at a higher level, they need to know that they're not, they're not gonna be stuck there. They're not gonna be stuck between 11 and 13. They need to know that there's opportunities to be part of management and to be a change within the system. That's why the problem solvers uh, idea that Mr. Hunt has brought together uh, or to the table, that's so important. And that's a part of the problem solving where you feel like I can't change this system. I can't do anything and bring forth innovative ideas in order to move things forward. And so in order to address that publicly, there are some agencies that have uh, had best practices with rank in place in which they're evaluating you as an individual and not necessarily you applying for a job or promotion where you are assessed as you are now qualified to move to 14, you are now qualified to move to GS-15. But then at that point, you then go and find the position within the agency in order to be able to do that. And so we need greater ease of being able to move to lateral and promotions and showing that pathway from mid-level to the senior level because that's where we're seeing nutrition and that's where you see it across the board. I would just uh, add to this, uh, and maybe it's uh, repetitive, but uh, increasing the number of on-ramps to public service, to federal service, is critical. Uh, we talked about the internships, we talked about the different fellowship programs. The larger number of those that exist within uh, each of these organizations, the more we're going to be able to acquaint folks who wouldn't otherwise have exposure to the public sector uh, to uh, these organizations. Another model that I think is incredibly effective is the Diplomat in Residence program uh, through the U.S. Department of State, where there's actually former either ambassadors or uh, church affairs who are on the ground, have an appointment at the university for a period of time. They're not only there to uh, uh, provide academic support and, and topical support to the unit, but also to recruit foreign service officers as well as for other uh, components of the U.S. State Department. I know not every agency, I fully, you know, not, not naive, I know not every agency can make that type of commitment, but something along those lines, because for a university, having somebody come alongside you and be an asset to the organization really compels the university to be a lot more engaged in focusing folks on the careers uh, in those areas. I'd like to address this. Uh, although several of the people here have, have made reference to sequestration and government shutdowns, um, I would add to that uh, the hiring freeze at the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, it, politics in general seems to be the elephant in this room. And at the Department of Veterans Affairs in particular, there have been about 50,000 vacancies now for going on three years, unfilled vacancies. and. It's not that they can't hire people, um, but there is another overriding policy going on, uh, which is to uh, gradually, rather than immediately, dismantle the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and, and privatize the Department of Veterans Affairs. And the Mission Act uh, will, has now, under the authority of the Mission Act, the department has issued uh, access standards that pretty much let anybody who can claim traffic jams in their, gen in their general area to, uh, permission to use uh, the private sector for health care. And it's not just really permission because uh, there isn't going to be adequate staff within VA medical facilities. They'll have to go um, outside into the private sector. And you've got a, a, a vicious cycle of, of um, understaffing, unstaffing, and you know, uh, eliminating the capacity of the VA. So they've got these uh, authorized FTE that they're not filling, about 50,000, which in itself could alleviate all these uh, you know, wait times for appointments, but they're not going to do it because there's a policy going on of privatization. VA is the worst case scenario, but there are a number of agencies that are currently not popular politically. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, 
the Interior Department, the Department of Energy, a lot of these agencies right now whose missions are not particularly supported by the current administration are not hiring deliberately because they don't want people in positions to carry out the mission of an agency that they object to. That can't be underestimated. Thank you. Um, Cedar White is red. I'm sure Commissioner Barney is generous with his time. I don't know that we should go into the fourth round. Uh, so let me recognize. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, but I, this is this is such an important issue, and I wanted Mr. Starr, would you like to comment as we can? I'd like to really continue this discussion. It's, it's really important to us. Thank you, sir. You're, you're very generous, and I'll try to be very quick. I want to come back to uh, Commissioner Skelly's point that about the importance of diversity, which I fully concur with. We're lacking generational diversity in the government, and that's fundamental to the health of the government right now and for the future. I also think it presents challenges in the ability to actually recruit and hold talent when you don't have a critical mass of young people in many organizations. Many of the recruiting issues that take place are really about a preponderance of focusing on prior experience rather than capability, and I think that's a cultural issue that will have to be addressed. Um, Commissioner Wada, you also raised the question about what can be done government-wide. I think that was a very important question. There are tools out there. There's something called the Competitive Services Act, which permits agencies to actually share certs. I think there are opportunities in high-demand talent areas like cyber talent, which ought to be viewed collectively, and that would improve the experience. But to me, the most fundamental insight that you had to offer is that there is this disconnect, and what we're losing sight of is the customer. And by and large, in the government, I think that move towards better customer focus is going to be vital to the health of the institution. And in this instance, it's the customer from the perspective of the talent market. We need that data to be readily available. We need leaders in government to be held accountable for what the customer perspective is on whether they can come into the jobs more easily and want to stay. And so that's something that I'd like your notion about. In my view, I'd call it something like a scorecard that's associated with leaders rather than organizations. At the end of the day, there's got to be a person that's held accountable or responsible. They have to be at a senior level, and they have to be not the HR function, but they have to be actually the executive function. Thank you. With the um, uh, the other key issue that we've been talking about here, and, and I know that uh, some of my other colleagues will want to talk on it, is, is this whole issue of the veterans' uh, preference. And Ms. Simon, in your earlier testimony, um, you, you described, and I think articulated very well, the, the fact that you know there are other issues that are out there where people and groups would advocate for other types of preferences, and to the extent that we need to avoid, of course, a, a government where everything, every hiring decision is based on preference because then we, we, we have no preferences at all. So I, I wonder if you could help us to understand how, as, at the policy-making level, how should our nation balance the importance of recognizing the contribution of honorable service by people who serve and are veterans with the, the need to be able to bring in generations, new generations of people into the workforce who can contribute to the diversity. Mr. Mr. Steyer, can you pick up with that one for us? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Look, I think that there are, um, you know, there's a clear important uh, public policy perspective that our country has gotten behind, which is the importance of supporting our veterans and that employment in the federal government is a critical way of demonstrating that support. I think the issue comes down to three different key points. The first, as a practical matter, the challenge from an operational perspective has two parts to it, and that is that oftentimes the application, not the existence, but the application of veterans' precedents causes a process difficulty, meaning that it becomes much more difficult for the hiring process to happen in a speedy and effective fashion. It doesn't need to be, but I think that's where things get hooked up, you know, get tripped up. The second piece is that comes back to the assessment question, which is oftentimes the assessment processes are bad such that hiring managers are given a veteran. There's nothing bad about them being a veteran, but they are not qualified actually for the job. And what you see then are certs that are being thrown back in, not because someone's a veteran, but because they're not actually getting the talent that they think they need to get the job done. But I think we have to go at the problems there, which are the process difficulties as well as the assessment parts. And then the third element, which has already been flagged, which I think is important, and the one you've raised here, is the balance issue, to recognize that there are balances, and you do see differences in the veteran population from other things. So one example of that is, yes, uh, women are one of the largest groups of you know, increases amongst veterans, but it's still the case. They're not as large as, as men, and by and large, when you see more veteran hiring, you sometimes see that gender difference becoming problematic in terms of diversity. 
uh, in the federal government. So keeping an eye on that, understanding the data, some of the things that I think we need to move towards in the government is less focus on front end process and more focus on back end accountability. Mm -hmm. We try to prevent all risk and problems from happening on the front end, and that creates oftentimes more harm and damage than anything else uh, that, that, that the original problem was intended to stop. But you can get at it by ensuring that people are, are addressed on the back end around accountability. I, I notice my time is about to expire. I'm just, I know other colleagues would like very much to look into this, so I'm gonna yield back. Actually, yield back in no time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, this, this question is really for Ms. Bowen and Mr. Stegmaier. It's tired, that's okay. Tired. You're not tired. Calling me, you're not calling me. My kids call me worse. Tired. Tired. I'm sorry. Uh, I won't get into what my kids call me. Uh, we, as we traveled, we found that, that the application process for USA Jobs was extremely long, very tedious, and oftentimes people just absolutely give up. What recommendation do you have that we may be able to, to share as a commission to, that would improve this process? Because it's, it's a death nail. If you can't get in the front door, then how in the world can you apply for a job with the federal service? Um, thank you for your, for your question. Um, I think over the years, uh, OPM has made significant strides on streamlining USA jobs. Uh, making it more understandable for applicants, and our 20, our two, our 2010 hiring reform effort was really geared towards applicants, making it easier for them to apply, not having to address the long essay questions, um, and then also being able to submit a streamlined resume. And we're still moving in that direction. We've created hiring paths so that if you're a military spouse, you can simply click on the military spouse and then the jobs will populate so that you understand that these are the opportunities that are available to you. Um, it's not perfect by, by any means, but I think it is dramatically better. Uh, but I think that what will help address um, the issue, what we have found is that people don't, again, it gets back to, you know, the providing information to help people understand, actually understand the hiring process. USA Jobs is the face. So when I'm entering and looking for a position, I go into USA Jobs. But behind that are the other talent acquisition systems, which are not all alike, but as much as possible, OPM works with each one of them to help standardize so that the experience is the same from one applicant to the other or from one system to the other. Um, but another thing is making sure that, you know, educating this, the public on the actual process, making sure that agencies take their responsibility with notifying the applicants. The one biggest complaint that we hear in addition to the time that it takes is, I've completed 100, 100 applications and I hear nothing. And so my application has gone into a black hole and I may hear something six months, maybe a year later to say that I was found qualified but I was not selected and I may have been referred to the selecting official. So OPM continually reinforces to agencies their requirement based on the 2010 hiring reform uh, presidential memorandum that was issued in the previous administration, their responsibility for notifying applicants we understand that not all private sector companies notify their applicants, nor do they have a responsibility to, but we know we have required our, our agencies to do that, and so we continually to continue to enforce that. But I think understanding the process from an applicant perspective, making sure that there's enough information, enough means for, a, for an applicant to be able to reach out to an agency to understand, what do you need from me in order for me to apply for this position? What are you looking for? And I think that that's where that's where sometimes the things fall short is the availability of people to be able to explain what the hiring process is all about. Our our system, our website is is very detailed, goes into you know what to do. There are videos, there are webinars that, that applicants can, can lean on or can refer to to help them help walk them through the process. But again, our efforts to continue to streamline have not ended uh, because of the, we also can collect feedback from applicants who abandon the process because it's just too complicated. So we continue to use that feedback to make improvements to our system. Thank you. Mr. Stern? Great, and I, I did want to alert you to the fact that I'm from Iowa, so west of Mississippi uh, as well here. Um, so I do think this is a really important question, and Kim has uh, really, I think, addressed the issues around the actual USA uh, today web uh, us jobs website it's a really um, i think fundamentally we have to normalize our process that we have a set of expectations that the larger private market is setting 
And we have to make sure that the federal government, understanding it has some specific different constraints, has to get as close to providing best-in-class experience that, that now Callum expects from the private sector. Mm -hmm. And part of it begins, again, back with the student internship piece, because you don't have to go through all that process. You actually know somebody who can help you make, you know, understand the system. Um, Kim, I think, is 100% right that a lot of this has to do with the individual agency responsibility in the, in the experience that people felt. And I think maybe if we get back to, to, to your thought, which is can we create that scorecard on agencies that actually looks at what that experience is like. Clearly one of the things is not simply are you told that you did or did not get the job, but where are you told where you are in the process? Right. I mean, that, that uncertainty is something that is you know, much more difficult for people to deal with. They'll take longer time periods. They understand how long it's actually going to be. Um, but I think it's connecting that customer service data to accountable individuals that are of seniority and individual agencies, creating competition amongst agencies in terms of creating best experience and benchmarking that against best in class in the private sector, and then creating alternative pathways uh, that you know student interns, et cetera, and then asking for from universities and other institutions on the outside additional support because it's certainly where we are today. Uh, it requires that support from the outside to be able to make your way through the system effectively. Thank you very much. And I lived in the Quad City for three years. We got it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to continue with my colleagues' uh, discussion of non competitive uh, preference, whether it be veterans' preference. We also um, have had recommendations that we um, we include other groups that would be given hiring preference interns, um, folks, folks that have completed federal internships or have worked in um, some of the national service programs. Um, and I don't, so I don't want to focus solely on, on the veterans preference, although that is the one that I think most people know about. Um, I know there's a, um, uh, there's a recommendation um, to extend the time that veterans preference can be used to 10 years instead of three years. Ms. Bryant, you, you mentioned that. And I certainly appreciate your rationale for that. Um, so that if somebody does want to use their uh, GI Bill, then they have some time afterwards to be able to explore um, federal service. However, as we've traveled around the country and we've talked to um, both federal employees or people who are interested in becoming federal employees. One of the consistent themes that we've heard, and, and I, my colleagues have mentioned this before, is if you're not a veteran, you essentially can't get into the federal government as a, as a, um, as a new individual who wants to come into the, the government. So one of the suggestions that we've heard from folks in some of the places across the country is that, th that individuals who have a preference, who are given, uh, afforded the opportunity of having a preference, should only be allowed to use it once. So for the, for the initial um, job um, application, and then once they're in the federal government, they lose that opportunity to use it again. Um, so my question, and, I, and I'll ask all of you, I, I would like everyone's um, perspective on this. If, if there was a recommendation to extend the period of time that veterans preference can be used or a non-competitive preference can be used after coming out of whatever it was that then gives them that opportunity, um, but only once. What are your views on that? I'll start with Ms. Bryan on that end of the table. Sure, uh, I'm gonna to try to say succinctly, um, my answer to that is I think that that's a, a reasonable solution. Um, it shouldn't be something that's used over and over again. And this is my, my personal opinion at the view of IEA, but it's a matter of where, if you're coming into the system, you don't wanna have barriers to coming into the system, especially as a, as a government uh, where you can see uh, transition being uh, more of a natural fit for you in certain ways in civil service, and so it's fair <coughs> to then say that um, then it's a one-time use. 
and, and that would be appropriate for bringing people in. But I want to also very quickly address some of the underlying cultural issues that we've talked about uh, throughout this panel that um, I, I think will illuminate some of the issues that you have, and that is after eight, just as we've seen in the military after 18 years of war, that they're failing to meet recruiting rates and some of the services, and then having to fudge the math a little bit to show when they are making recruiting quotas, then uh, what we also see in the same for the new generations coming into federal service is that, again, I know I sound probably like a broken record at this point, it's not about getting in, it's about what do you do after that. And the talent management is the problem. The maritime is the problem in the military, it's a problem in civil service. You need to be able to be a person who's in their mid-30s to 40s, who can see a pathway to senior management. And that's really where we're lacking right now. It's because of uh, poor morale across many agencies. It's because of the hiring freezes, the pay freezes that uh, federal workers endured for three years uh, under the previous administration. It's due to a political influence, and uh, I, I concur with uh, a lot of the statements that are happening within the VA that uh, um, Ms. Simon already spoke to, particularly with the dearth of mental health employees within the VA, but that's also a microcosm of what's happening across the country. Why? And that is of those 50,000 vacancies, 49,000 to be exact, um, about 30,000 of them are related to mental health, behavioral health. You don't have that many providers in the country. So that's a part of the problem is that you're not pulling in people, young people, into the jobs we need into this future, in, in, in our future society. And knowing that mental health is one of those areas across the board, that's something where you can uh, influence recruiting at a much lower level and bringing people in. But there's a lot of this that has to do with harmful policy that starts in the military, transitions over to the public sector, and it's a reason for why people either are reticent to join or don't stay. And then lastly, also back to your point, Ms. James, of uh, people who feel as though they can't get in from the military perspective, it's because they see, again, I, I know derisively uh, it's a term, the colonel left behind, but that's because if you are senior enlisted or if you are junior officer, but there's an 05 or 06 who's retiring and they wanted to take off the uniform and go into the same job, they get the preference before you do. That's a problem. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I use my round three? To uh, he, we will invoke the WADA <laughs> exception. Uh, <laughs> we could reset the time. Uh, we'll begin your third thank round, you, Ms. second round. Yes. So. Um, and thank you for your for your question. And this is a question that OPM gets all the time. I mean, we can tell from the numbers of applicants that uh, have accounts on USA Jobs, which is over 21 million, that there's truly an interest of, of the wide variety of people in the population who want to come into federal service. Uh, with regard to veterans preference, I, I believe that there has been uh, some legislation proposed by DOD under one of the NDAAs to allow what they refer, refer to as one bite of the apple. And that if you are a veteran and you have preference and you use that preference to get into the federal service once you're in a career or a traditional position, then you're not allowed to use your preference anymore and then that opens up the, the door to allow other persons to come in uh, to the government. Um, that is something, any any recommendation that the commission would make with regard to easing uh, how veterans preference is used, of course, would take uh, changes in law, but I think that OPM would be open to standing by to, to assist and consider uh, any other recommendations, but um, we know that this is an issue um, and we are open to this. Mr. I'll just be briefly, I'll take off my uh, ASU hat and put on my veteran hat, uh, and I think it's perfectly fair. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the main time that a veteran needs to utilize that veteran's preference in order to acquire a job in the federal government is upon transition, as Ms. Bryant uh, was talking about. And I think that's a perfectly fair uh, thing, and I think that most veterans um, would, you know, kind of see it in that same perspective. Uh, we aren't a veteran service organization, but a third of our membership are veterans. Um, I think that they would not be very happy about that idea, um, and I base that on uh, how much opposition there is to a policy that was adopted in the NDAA a couple of years ago, three years ago, I guess, uh, that um, reduced the importance of, uh, of veteran status uh, in, um, in the context of RIF. Um, it, it elevated uh, performance ratings um, and, and, and lowered the importance of being a veteran or uh, uh, lending service. Um, it's something that's very controversial. 
Um, the only thing I would really like to say to your question is that veterans preference is pretty much the only preference in federal hiring that is recognized as a preference. Um, and it's great that we're having this conversation because I don't think that most people recognize uh, the Pathways Program and its predecessor, President, President's Management Intern Program that was found by a, a court to be uh, in violation of veterans preference. Um, these are, there's so many of these kinds of <coughs> pipeline things that exclude and, uh, and, and go against the notion of open competition. Only veterans preference gets, gets acknowledged as a preference and presented for that reason. So I would think very carefully about only focusing on veterans preference as, a, as something that, that uh, needs to be reevaluated while you expand all kinds of other uh, effective preferences. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I think for most of the panel, the notion of a single bite of the apple is one that seems a reasonable balance given the other things we've talked about. We would hold the same here at the partnership. Um, what I would also just point out uh, very quickly, I had a colleague here, an amazing gentleman who knew the system better than anyone else I've ever seen. Uh, and he would always stop me whenever I talked about um, intern conversion as being non-competitive and say, no, it's not that it's non-competitive. It's actually even better uh, rules on competition because you actually can assess these people way better than any test or interview could possibly give you and that is you have an opportunity to work with them so um, the real issue on the intern conversion isn't that you're giving someone a preference what you're doing is offering the agency that they might go to an opportunity to assess them in a much deeper way than any other tool can provide and you're likely also to get uh, a broader set of talent willing to take that uh, gamble of what a, a summer internship or an in-year internship might look like to check out public service. So again, I think these are different kinds of issues, and if anything, the, the, the opportunity to get better assessment is, is, is fundamental in this process. Thank you. I'll yield back the rest of my round <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to build on the conversation about getting more people, especially younger people, into federal service. And we are, for the first time, the Commission on Military and National service, which is very exciting that Congress decided, well, let's look at three of these under one umbrella. So the question is, uh, and this is for uh, Max and Brian, uh, Mr. Hunt, and anyone, all of you who want to comment, how and how much should the federal government be encouraging this sort of cross-sector service? So for example, it's great that we have veterans going into federal service, and we talked about, we had some great testimony about how to improve that. Better. Uh, we have a preference for Peace Corps alumni and VISTA alumni for non competitive hiring once they leave. But our other Corps alumni don't have that. Should they have that? Uh, we've heard from folks at FEMA Corps that FEMA Corps was originally designed to get young people, you know, expand national service opportunities. But one of the unanticipated benefits has been that then a lot of those folks who do that year in FEMA Corps <coughs> then end up joining FEMA. They're younger, they're more diverse. Uh, so I guess the question is, what could and should we be doing to encourage more cross-stream? And also, federal government employees may want to go and do a term of national service after their uh, federal service. So what would we be doing? What ideas do we have to encourage sort of this cross-sector, especially getting young people who've done service period into federal service? I guess we'll start with Brian and with Max and it's kind of uh, Simon and Sure, I think that um, there's a really great initiative that was started by General McChrystal called Service Year Alliance. And so in getting young people to, uh, after high school, using that gap year, and then going into some service of some capacity, whether it's with Peace Corps, Teach for America, et cetera. Those, I think, are successful pipelines. And I'm afraid I don't have that data, but I could always reach back to colleagues there and find out how successful it's been. I know that their goal is to get at least one million high schoolers, high school graduates, into a service program, and then that can be get uh, further federal service. Uh, the other thing has to do with, again, it has to do with culture and policy of what you need to remedy in order to allow for more service. Um, some things you just can't fix. For example, I was an intelligence officer. I can't go to the Peace Corps. So, um, but, you know, that's something I would love to do, but that's something that you, it's, you're barred from doing that. But in terms of, advocating for the cross-governmental uh, service, if you will, the cross-federal service. Uh, it's 
very much complementary to leveraging what we've learned within the military, taking those lessons learned. I will say to Ms. Simon's point that the resentment is real of veterans coming in, especially these of be preference, and that's because we're only 1% of the country now. That's because we have a country that's disconnected after 18 years of war who just don't even know what's still happening. So that's the problem uh, in our greater American society of when you think that we're a monolithic group and that we're all coming in with the same ways of thinking. And when you want to increase that diversity and to uh, Mr. Starr's point of women being the fastest growing demographic that's still not being reflected in the applicant pool, that's because historically there have been barriers to women and minorities and especially if you happen to be a woman minority, then there are barriers to advancement in the military. And so you're going to face barriers to advancement within federal government as well if you didn't achieve the same ranks as um, white male counterparts did within the federal service, in the government service. So, Alan, kudos to you for all the work you've done with service here and everything around that. Uh, it's phenomenal, and I think to your point, I think it's terrific that this commission is looking at this not in silos, but as a collective set of opportunities. And there are a lot, obviously, of things that could should be done. I think it's even more important in today's world where no sector owns all the experience and knowledge that it needs, and all sectors actually need to work together to be able to deal with our most pressing problems. So I think one of the challenges we honestly have now in the federal government itself is that there's very little mobility. People are very uh, you know, uh, insular in terms of their experience. They rarely do have cross-sector experience. Example, we haven't talked about this, but the leadership ranks in government 92% of the SES come from within government. Only 8% of them actually move agencies once they become SES members. And so they're not actually exposed to either cross-sector or even cross-governmental uh, capabilities, relationships, uh, problem-solving techniques, et cetera. So we need to see much, much more of that if we're gonna have a more robust uh, government. And it's something that talent wants. They, they, so I think creating opportunities like the passport program we talked about, where you can come out of government, do something, that yeah, skill yourself up and come back in at the level that you deserve rather than the level you left would be one example. In my view, we should actually have requirements for people who are going to become in the SES that they actually have to have had experience in multi-sectors, multi-levels of government or multiple agencies. And we should be promoting in a positive way uh, the ability for, uh, for young people to come in for shorter tours of duty. Some people may want to stay, but um, I think knowing that there is the fellowship opportunity where they're treated uh, you know, uh, very well would be a good way of doing it. That's what we're trying to do in our cyber talent initiative. Great, thank you. And how do you feel about expanding Peace Corps and VISTA now have that non-competitive iron to other AmeriCorps I, I, I honestly think that's a, uh, it would be a good thing to do. Again, my, my view is that you're, you're, you have an opportunity to be able to assess these people in a different way because they've actually demonstrated in the service environment capabilities. Obviously, managers still need to make good choices about who they're actually hiring, whether it's direct hire or not. Uh, so I think um, it's still the case that even though Peace Corps uh, you know, has the preference that a lot of agencies don't even know about it, don't even use it, and we need to change that cultural norm as well. So one of the things that we've really tried to do uh, with our work is to reimagine what we mean by public service. So, uh, you know, when somebody says thank you for your service, that, that shouldn't be something that's solely for the military. That should be for anybody who's giving of themselves to something larger than themselves. Another focus that we've had is cross-sector collaboration. So the six courses that our students take are in cross-sector collaboration. They get a certificate in cross-sector collaboration uh, and leadership. And so when we talk sectors, we're talking public, private, nonprofit, and in some cases, the military sector. We're not necessarily talking about FDA versus USDA versus Interior. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I think would be a benefit, and, and I'll leave it to smarter people than me like Kim to design what this would actually look like on the ground, but is that somebody can envision for themselves a career where they can start in AmeriCorps, which would then lead to a job in a federal agency, which may then lead them to a foundation, a nonprofit, but then would not preclude them from down the road being qualified to come back into government service. Again, with that direction that I want to impact this in my life, and I'm going to do that in a cross-sector way that will touch various, again, public, private, nonprofit uh, sectors. Sure, thank you. I know, Mr. Chairman, I'm a little over time, but if uh, Ms. Simon or Ms. Holden want to comment. We will extend a lot of James exemption. <laughs> I just thank you for your question um, with regard to non-competitive eligibility. Um, I mean, I know that um, 
OPM and the federal sector does value the experience that uh, they're gaining through national service. And it, we do consider that a part of public service and some efforts some years ago with regard to um, expanding national service, we made sure the agencies understood that if you have applicants that have completed national service, then just like volunteer service, that is something that can be used to qualify them for any position that they're applying for. So we had a huge effort underway to train hiring managers, to train supervisors, that you know when you see this on, when you see AmeriCorps, or when you see Vista Corps, FEMA Corps on someone's resume, that is true experience that they've gained. They've gained leadership values and leadership competencies and technical training that would be that could be fitting and qualify them for uh, for even the public service. And so we um, we do value that. Um, with regard to extending non-competitive eligibilities or expanding non-competitive eligibilities, uh, this question is posed to OPM uh, many times. But um, our um, our concern is also creating. Uh, preferences for different groups versus making sure that there's fair and open competition across across all sectors. Uh, but again, we would be willing to uh, review or, and consider any recommendations from this commission. Thank you. Uh, if you still have time, I have something I'd like sure. to say. Sure. Um, one of the biggest fights that, that we're in right now is, is defending federal employees' due process rights um, and collective bargaining rights. And um, the more you have, uh, you know, hire, direct hiring and hiring based on preferences, you, in theory anyway, are not necessarily getting the most qualified candidate. You're getting the candidate uh, or uh, the uh, employee who, uh, with a combination of the preference and their capabilities, got the job. And that, in turn, gives rise to arguments for, well then, if it's gonna be easier to hire, then it's gonna to have to be easier to fire. And it's harder to justify the due process rights that federal employees have to defend their jobs. Now, people aren't only fired for poor performance or misconduct. Sometimes they're fired for, for bad reasons. And when you take away due process rights, then you take away the ability uh, to defend the apolitical civil service, defend against corruption. You can defend against bad reasons for people being hired or fired. And that's why I would caution you all, before you start extending more uh, preferences and uh, expanding direct hire, which is already very expansive, uh, think about that because as soon as you do that, then you'll have managers screaming that we need to be able to get rid of them quickly because we had to hire damaged goods or people with uh, with who only got the job through preference. And that's not our attitude, but that's the kind of thing we hear all the time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bryan, I wanted to come back to the question of veterans' preferences. And I can understand why it's being raised, uh, but I wanted to, whether we're talking about this in the uh, context of the duration uh, with which the veteran can in invoke the veteran's preference or after which it did not, uh, or the one bite of the apple. If those kinds of changes are gonna be considered, should there be a carve out or accommodations for the combat veterans, the, the wounded veterans, who are coming home with uh, injuries that are of such a nature that makes it difficult to, uh, to get employment or stay employed. Um, as you well know, many of those who have these combat injuries, it might be five or ten years before they're at a point where they're able to get back into the workforce or, um, or, or PTS, anxiety issues, make it difficult to commute to work on a crowded metro. Should we be considering accommodations for them in this context if we go down that road? Absolutely. Uh, those who are service-connected disabilities going into federal service, being able to contribute to uh, what they believe in and something greater than themselves, that's the type of uh, attitude that you bring into military service that veterans bring into uh, civil service. And that's something where you should have consideration for. Now, I'll um, caveat that with saying with combat veteran, service-connected, disabled, things like that, I mean, that's, 
I, I don't have exact data on it, but you're not really remedying a problem there of, of extending to 10 years. And the reason why is because there's so many of us who are now combat veterans, and so many of us now who are service connected, myself included. And so when you factor that in, your Venn diagram becomes a bit wider of your pool of applicants who are gonna come in who would need that type of accommodation. But the t extending from three to 10 years will allow at least for the types of transitions that you're talking about. You have many wounded warriors who come back who are perfectly capable to serve, but are not ready right at that point. And so giving them time to, um, let's say, uh, you know, re-enter uh, within the civilian world, get themselves together, and then coming over with either one bite of the apple, but having an extension and doing that. If there are extenuating circumstances for more than 10 years, I, I can only think of maybe a small percentage who would need more than a decade in order to be further acclimated into the civilian world. But there may be special exceptions there. And so for that case, for that small percentage, then it might make sense to go beyond 10 years. And I assume you, you would agree that employment is part of that rehabilitation. Absolutely. That's an important part. You're probably more articulate, you are more articulate on it than I am. If you want to explain that uh, a little bit. Absolutely, and that's uh, something I put within my written testimony as well. But again, being a part of community, being a part of um, being able to, to work and still contribute to society, that goes, that helps us in going against the broken bed narrative, which is so prevalent within our society and unfortunately probably contributes to resentment of veterans coming in because there's still people who think that this is Vietnam, there's still political influences, there's a lot that's going on with people who don't realize the burdens that we have borne after nearly 20 years of war. And so they were essentially considered not to be as effective or were somehow battle damaged or in some other way, not capable of doing the same jobs. And um, it's become a popular refrain to think of us as, you know, group thinkers and, and we're not bringing the diversity of thought. But what you see in this generation that's come up post 9-11 is that there is a great diversity of thought, there is a great diversity of ideas, and part of the reason why you may leave military service may simply be because you wanted to be able to express that more. And I completely agree with the continuum of, um, of service throughout your career, probably as an exemplar of it, and that is going from military to civil service to nonprofit, and then maybe going back to federal government. And that's something that you need to leave on the table in terms of veterans and seeing that continuum of service to the country. I wanted to give Ms. Holden a chance if, if you wanted to weigh in on the first part of the question, service connected and, and then accommodation for those. Um, I think that from an OPM standpoint that um, I mean, we already, we have uh, hiring authorities in place specifically for uh, service connected or disabled veterans, uh, which uh, agencies utilize uh, to a great extent. Uh, and I think that continuing to honor uh, those, that type of preference for disabled veterans is, is something noble that we need to continue to do. Um, if I may, uh, the VA Accountability Act, which was passed by Congress a few years ago, um, makes it easy to fire uh, employees of the Department of Veterans Affairs. About 80% of the several thousand who've been fired under that law were service-connected uh, disabled veterans in very low-level positions. Uh, so there's very little accommodation for the special needs of that, pop that work population in a, in, of all places, the Department of Veterans Affairs. And if I could just to dovetail on your point, agree in terms of the statistics that she cited, um, we haven't seen as many higher managers leaving uh, the VA under the VA accountability yet, and that's also a problem too. Um, and so I see the case of the VA is particularly politicized when you're looking at these issues. I think everything you would have that context. The VA right now is in the crosshairs of a major political fight that's happening right now, as, as Ms. Simon has articulated throughout this panel. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd just like to say from this end of the table, the Wada James exception looks like an entitlement. <laughs> and, 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 and I, Reference, actually. And, and I would like my piece of the pie. Uh, um, what, what I'd like to do um, is, uh, you know, we're from the federal government and we're here to help and we've been talking in depth and to an incredibly informative level about um, the, the federal civil service. Um, but when we go on the road, we're talking to people at the, at the state, local, and even in tribal um, governments and organizations. So I'd like to walk that dog just a little bit here, if I could, with uh, Mr. Steyer, Ms. Bryant, and Mr. Hunt. Um, Mr. Steyer, what's your, what's your perspective? What's the partnership's perspective on how these factors 
with regard to talent and propensity, and, and how, how applicable are they at, at, this, at the lower levels of government in, in the nation? What's your appreciation? So my, my sense is that the issues are largely the same. I think that there's some really interesting programming that uh, I've seen in the nonprofit side of, of organizations trying to get leaders to go back to their communities and work in state and local government, which is terrific to see. I think that this comes back to a point that, that Alan was raising earlier about um, the opportunity to connect all those dots, which your question is driving us towards. And I think that uh, we do would benefit from more intergovernmental flow of talent. Uh, so much of the way the system actually works is not um, separate entities, but rather uh, a need for all those various levels of government as well as the nonprofit sector. When, when something really happens, absolutely. they're all standing right alongside. Well, and, and when something happens, certainly, absolutely, and disaster you know, response is an example of that. But I think, in point of fact, we're actually doing work now on the West Coast. We've started a partnership West, and it's really driven by this perspective that so much of what the federal government actually has to do is intergovernmental and, and work effectively with state and local government to address problems that are in the community. And, and bluntly, there's not enough attention paid to that. So we're working as an example with five federal agencies that are responsible for disaster preparedness response, helping them to collaborate themselves better together and then with the, uh, the, the, their, their, their colleagues from uh, state and local government and the, the private sector. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's always about talent. It's always about relationships, people learning capabilities together. And so the more we can see flow uh, of talent, the more mobility you have, I think you will actually create more capability and, and an outcome for the public. So I think this is same set of issues. There are opportunities for more collaboration uh, and there ought to be even in place more effort to create relationship between the different uh, levels of government. That's answering your question. It, it does, thank you. Um, Ms. Brown, how are veterans doing from IAVA's perspective at other levels of government? Um, uh, which levels of government? State, state, state local. State state local. They're, they're doing quite well, and what we see in our membership is that they do go into state and local, and in fact, our advocacy model then is exactly that, to go back into the community and to uh, whether it's through advocacy as a nonprofit or going to state and local, that's absolutely a focus of IAVA as well as the veterans community as a whole. Um, you uh, also have members and staff who've left from IAVA, particularly our uh, veteran transition managers who are master uh, level social uh, 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 case managers, social workers, etc., to where they are able to then go to the VA afterward and are to serve in that capacity, particularly within the behavioral health, as I mentioned where we, there is a need. But um, I completely agree with the comments made by several on the panel that continuous workflow, that interagency um, uh, connectivity is vital to being able to show that both up and down between federal to the local level and then also across, build those relationships to work towards a common goal. For example, right now we have a public health crisis with suicide and it is exacerbated within the veteran community where we lose 20 souls a day to suicide. And so in understanding that problem, it's a whole of government, whole of community solution. Yes, it's VA's job, job primarily, and they're in charge of the task force to move quickly on it. But it's something where all of our advocacy groups, all the nonprofits, all of the uh, medical associations, say your, your uh, American Psychological and Sociological, uh, excuse me, um, psychiatric associations, all of these groups are now coming together to work with government in order to, to solve this problem of suicide. And with that, you're going to see those relationships in that, that community bubble continue to widen. And as an individual then, for veterans, you're able to then move within that space. And that's something that can create more opportunity for veterans coming into federal service. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hunt, um, your program, early days, just graduated your first class. What's your appreciation is that, are there any differences in getting people into and the, and the hunger for talent at the state and local level, especially since you're in a state university. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Skelly. So I've got a couple different boxes uh, to unwrap here. <laughs> the first one um, being, we run a veterans program uh, as part of the Public Service Academy. We identified a need, again, we talked about how we can expand or uh, retract uh, based on the needs in our university. Uh, we identified that we needed a veterans program uh, within the organization. What, I, what we really talk about with our veterans uh, while they're at the university um, is how can you be useful to your community. So you served your country, you're here at the university getting your degree, advancing yourself. 
um, how can you then be useful to your community? And I think that gets to this idea of being able to move between federal service, uh, nonprofit service, uh, state level service, county level service, running for the city council, right? All this whole variety of ways that you can continue being a, a civic asset uh, to your community, to, to the nation. So I think there is a tenor and tone component to that, a storytelling component to that, that could be really important uh, for uh, specifically uh, veterans, right? Your service is not done. It just is transitioning to a different part of our society. The second uh, thing is we, again, really focus with our students at the undergraduate level on this idea of um, uh, developing character-driven leaders with the courage to cross sectors, connect networks, and ignite action for the greater good. To unpack that courage to cross sectors, that's really hard, right? If you're in the Arizona Department of Veteran Services working with uh, one of the nonprofits, the VSOs, Right? That's not a natural thing, right? We kind of are in our silo. I work for the state government. This is what I do. This is what I can't do. This is what I can do. But in the state of Arizona, they've done a really incredible job of passing information back and forth, of being able to be an asset to each other. So I think, again, it comes to this idea of, of one, having the mechanisms for that to be possible, uh, policy-wise, uh, within the organization, and then also this mindset, right? This mindset that you're, I, I'm a VA employee, I can only work up and down within my organization, but rather this mindset that I can work left and right. And we really try to instill that uh, in our students at the undergraduate level through exercises where they have to go through this and say, who's the stakeholder on homelessness in the private sector? Who's the stakeholder in the public sector? Who's the stakeholder uh, uh, in the nonprofit sector? And pull those different pieces together. Thanks, and a quick follow up with you, sir. Good. Uh, since you're, I believe you mentioned you're placed in the predominant early days again, but predominantly um, folks are moving towards uh, state and local work in your program so far. Um, are you, do you have any feel that the, the state and local governments are looking for people markedly different than at the federal level, that those same factors apply with regard to talent? That's a great question. I think by and large they are looking for the same talent. There are so many more on ramps to state and local service. Uh, for somebody on the ground in Tempe, Arizona, or uh, San Diego, California, et cetera. There are so many more on ramps that that's the natural place for folks to go. The internships are there, uh, the fellowships are there, and there's a direct pathway uh, already established. And so I, I believe that's why that's happening. If there were more of those internships, if there were more internships with the Bureau of Land Management, which has a huge footprint in the state of Arizona, I think we would have more folks going into BLM and some of these other agencies because there would be more on ramps for it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any other last minute questions from the Commissioner? Uh, I do have one quick one. Uh, it strikes me, I'm trying to make a marriage between uh, Mayor and Ms. Uh, in terms we have an outstanding program, we have a track, we have OPM. Has there been any discussion between OPM and Arizona State University as MOU or, uh, I mean, it seems to be a possibility. So we just met this morning. <laughs> um, we, have, we have had minimal conversation, but I am intrigued by uh, the type of program that, that uh, he has established at Arizona State. And it's something that I think uh, there are some agencies that establish similar types of programs, but from a corporate perspective, an enterprise perspective from where OPM sits, these are the types of programs that we could certainly um, look into and advocate. Uh, we did have a similar type of partnership with Cal State um, Fullerton and, um, and a couple of the other Cal State uh, or uh, colleges in, in California a few years ago. Uh, and agencies were interested in um, forming those types of partnerships and mainly to, to help provide an education and uh, an entry point of just interest for students to get them to understand that there is opportunity in the federal, in the federal service. And so we will definitely be talking and exchanging information. Quick one, if I may. Um, we've heard um, um, a great interest about uh, the idea of permeability 
between um, like the private sector and, and government, both for people who serve in the military as well as people in public service. Um, very short question, I'm gonna go to, to you, Ms. Holden, on this one is, is there currently any authorities that allow for people who are in public service to actually leave a public position, a public service position to go into the military, I don't mean as a reservist being brought on active duty, but, but to actually go into the military for a period of time or to go into national service for a period of time and be able to return to to the, um, to the public service. And, and after your very short answer on whether there are authorities, I would say to Ms. Simon, if there was the kind of protections to allow people to, to do that for the purposes of expanding their careers, would that be a good thing for the, for the federal work? Uh, there is um, one of our uh, legislative proposals is for a uh, the private public partnership uh, for the STEM community, and which will allow for uh, persons in it is an exchange, uh, an exchange program that would allow persons from the federal sector to go into uh, the private sector and vice versa in order to exchange ideas, exchange knowledge and experience. So that is one of the uh, proposals that has been. Uh, that's being floated right now. Right, but is there that kind of authority currently in place that would allow people who are currently in the in the public service sector to go into national service or into military service and then return? I think the yeah. answer is no. The answer is no. And so and then I would just very briefly to Ms. Simon, uh, recognizing that you know people who have earned and have uh, have performed well in in public service, if they were to do this, if they could have some sort of protections that allow them to re-enter public service. Would this be a good thing for the federal workforce? Well, you're asking me if it would be a good thing for the federal workforce. I, I'll answer that it I don't think it would be a good thing for the federal government. Um, we have entertained these kinds of proposals for decades now. Um, it's been proposed over and over and over again, and we often <coughs> refer to it as an opportunity to case the joint. Um, what happens um, when these kinds of things are tried are that contractors come in and, and they see which, uh, which parts of the federal operation um, are profitable and that they could take over uh, and, and the agency would then divest itself and, and, and the contractor could start <laughs> earning some money off of it. Uh, we think government should be performed on a not-for-profit not basis in-house and uh, we're not really interested in facilitating outsourcing. And that's what, however well-intentioned that kind of thing is with the idea of, okay, I'll, I can learn something from you and you can learn something from me. What it ends up being is an opportunity to uh, see what, what are the juicy parts that can be outsourced. Thank you. Just close um, with a question to you, Max, perhaps. And um, I guess my reflection is this. College president for 18 years and in higher education talking to loads of students. They want to do they want to go to the federal government, but the state won't. But the timing's all off. All of their contemporaries, particularly undergraduates, in the private sector have offers for fall, early spring. Recruiters come to campus. We've heard how the paucity of federal. So what do you say to them to inspire? Because or what would you observe to us if there's fundamentally a, a very different timing sequence. And it then leaves hopeful undergraduates in a position of waiting or or whatever. And you hear it particularly and finally from first gen students who would say, look, I've been advantaged by this education by opportunity. And the pressure now is to obviously um, make a difference for my family, right? Which has prepared me and formed me for this newly minted college degree. So what would you observe to them and to us? Well, so I think your observation is spot on. You know, by and large, the federal government doesn't recruit, and there are clear exceptions to this. You've got the Diplomat in Residence Program, Peace Corps has folks in a bunch of different areas. But it's small. Yeah, it's small, exactly right. right. Just... Absolutely right, but I want to be clear that there are yeah. corners of the government that do this right, but they're not operating with the best-in-class uh, approaches that um, other organizations are doing, and therefore they lose out on the talent that we would that we all hurt get hurt by. Um, your question, though, is to the talent itself. How, what do you communicate to them? My view is you communicate with the value of the job itself. There is no substitute for government service. You're working for our most important institution, a core part of our democracy, that has the premature of the public and taxpayer resources 
behind it, and it's all about solving our most difficult problems. There's no bigger stage, no more important stage to use your talents for the good of, of the world. So that's the value proposition, and we know that the workforce today is you know, incredibly mission committed. Those are the people that are actually coming to, to serve. Um, we should not be in a world, however, that uh, the talent has to go through all the hurdles that it currently does to actually get there. And that is my hope for you know, this uh, operation, which is that you will make it better. And you will, you will come up with not only an here and now set of recommendations and see them through, but we also need a government that is more agile. The world is changing faster, it seems trite to say it, but what we need is a government that is not racing to keep up with the past. And that's in many ways what we have right now. We need a government that can actually be agile and flexible and move to the future uh, on a continuous basis. And so, and that would be my argument for why there are risks to some of the exchanges we talk about, but we need to see more of that uh, for, for that reason. We need a government that has the refreshed ideas. It no longer sets the norm across all sorts of different areas. So anyway, but the key point I think is they need to be introduced to it. My bigger worry is not so much that people have an informed decision that they've made that's too difficult. I don't think most people even think about it at all. That's what our research has shown. And uh, this is maybe jumping to your end piece, but my takeaway from this is the incredible experience you have all had talking to people across the country. And we need to make sure that that voice that you heard is now a part and parcel of the process that we use in government to get talent. And to me, that is one of the more fundamental opportunities for, for the work you're doing. Well, I thank you for that charge and benediction rolled into one, <laughs> and for your hospitality here. And, and yeah. certainly to Ms. Simon, Mr. Hunt, Ms. Holden, Ms. Brian, we thank you for your uh, prepared testimony and for this great conversation today. We officially dismiss this panel. We invite you certainly to take seats in the front row where we now turn to uh, providing an opportunity for our public uh, guests here to provide any comments. This commission is committed to transparency and openness uh, with the public and in keeping with the principles the commission intends to provide the public with an opportunity to deliver public comments during our hearings. As a reminder, in order to provide the greatest opportunity for as many participants to offer comment as you would like, public comment is limited here to two minute period per person. As noted on our website, sign up for public comment took place between the opening of registration and the start of this hearing. And when you signed up, you received a number of ticket. And to ensure fairness, tickets were randomly drawn. We will call out some ticket numbers at a time and ask that uh, when your number is called, you come forward and make a line behind the microphone right here in the center uh, of the uh, audience here and provide your comment. Uh, and we will proceed in the ticket number order. So if time is document, and I think certainly it will, if you'd offer your oral comment, we encourage any members of the public to submit your written comments to our website, which is www.inspire2serve.gov, and that is the numeral two. Additionally, if you have any written statements that you'd like to submit for the record, we offer and encourage you to please provide them to uh, our staff colleagues at the registration desk. So, with that, I am now invite uh, the following ticket uh, individuals to provide comments. 075, 076, and 074. 75, 76, 74. Mr. Uh, numbers. We got some guests here. Sure. Welcome. Excuse me, I don't have a ticket. Can I test one? Uh, sure. Uh, you can test one. Sure. Yeah, let's go through these and then we'll. We'll the water, James. Um, good morning. My name is Bill Galvin, and I'm the counseling coordinator at the Center on Conscience and War. And as you all know from previous hearings, um, there are millions of men who now cannot apply for any federal job, or almost any federal job, because they have not registered with Selective Service. Um, now, many of them probably were just unaware of the registration at the time, uh, but, but there are people of conscience who, you know, a conscientious objector under US law is somebody who, uh, because of their values, is opposed to participation more in any form. And some of those view registering with selective service as a form of participating in war. And so these folks are then 
permanently barred from any of these employment jobs that we've been talking about trying to you know, find ways to get people in. So, so one way, of course, to, uh, to, to further that cause would be to either end the registration or certainly end these penalties for people who have not registered. Uh, if the government extends this to women, then we're going to double the number of folks who cannot apply for any of these jobs we've been talking about this morning. So, so and, and, and I want to tell you about somebody who called us last year. Uh, he was an immigrant. He, he migrated here when he was in his 20s, uh, before he turned 26. But he turned 26 before he knew about the Cypher Service registration. He was hired as a temp in the state of Florida, which is one of the states that doesn't allow you to uh, get a job there if you haven't registered. And so he's continued as a temp for a number of years. He's a good employee. He's trained a number of people who have become permanent employees and advanced up the ladder, yet he is stuck at this entry-level temp position because of this. So this, this is something that this commission could address uh, with the proper kind of a recommendation. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for obliging our time limits. I will direct all our public commenters to uh, the light system here. I'm going to go to yell. It's 30 seconds remaining. I'm Peter Gisela, Vietnam Air Veteran. I joined Air Force rather than being drafted. At the hearings in Los Angeles, I spoke and submitted a detailed information about a House bill from 1979 that outlined significant changes to the Selective Service system, very similar to the Commission's mandate. My verbal focus was on the proposal to move registration to the 17th birthday for an on and off one year discussion on what being patriotic means, especially in the voluntary performance of service and its many forms and activities, such as military, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, contracted service, or local community volunteerism. Since most youth would still be in high school, the intention was for a federal law that provided the basic framework and resource information. However, local high schools, education districts, and every zip code across the nation would design their own syllabus and help include other youth not in high school. They both could then share the label of government boogeyman. In January, I was very disappointed to review the interim, interim report and not read any reference to this catalyst for a thinking conversation on patriotic contributions to the civic society. I hope my presence here today will more startling impress on you the importance of this highly cost-effective youth wake-up call to citizen service. Since 1979, I've asked leaders, professionals, institutions, and various disciplines to become aware of this nuance of this bill's intentions with a specific reference to the proposal of moving initial registration to the 17th birthday for this one-year discussion. All above it provided me less than 1% feedback, a great mystery to me. I hope this commission can request feedback from educators, national security, economic, social studies, <coughs> et cetera, experts and institutions to provide a more detailed modification of why not moving registration to the 17th birthday for every zip code conversation. Thank you, sir. Uh, we've gone through 75, 76, 74. We have, um, I guess, uh, for recognized for two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, it's not for the whole panel. My name is Lia. I'm a PhD in economics, but I've been very busy as a genuine reformer, advocate, and activist. I've been TV producer for the Citizen Times, Freedom Times, about 100 episodes per each. But my concern is that I am now here uh, just like a a dead man crusading because I am treated as a dead man everywhere I go, including my assets, property, or identification, or my position. When I work for the government, I was in the Department of Health and Human Service as an extramural. I handled the most project, and my project was reviewed by outside professional as the best in their seven years of service. So I was promoted to the intramural. They are this National Center for Health Services. And I discovered their data is wrong, fraudulent, and the patient proper is not doing right, and it's not treated right. So all this problem now, I follow this, and I got the Supreme Court 
and appeal to the law schools up and down and take a decades of time. So we find out from the beginning improper processing of complaint. So that means we including the Department of Just, uh, Health Human Services and EEOC, the MSPB and uh, government attorneys and, uh, since, and judicial system. Those core personnel, uh, they're taking everything. So I hope that to, to help uh, improve our services, we must follow those complaint procedures. Where they, where is going wrong, we got to fix them. And now we have a PPP, that's the most we, we, we <laughs> serious fraud and crime information uh, network operation. They increase local to federal to global and almost every sector, every agency. That's why nowadays you can see everywhere, every hearing, you hear that PPP because they are promoted, they are profit over the prison, uh, government uh, people. So please, I have submitted my affidavit before and then uh, that attachment before. Please read it. Every Thank word you. means something. Thank you very much. If that seems to be a story, I, I will help you to investigate those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Again, I want to thank all of our panelists for providing their testimony today and for all of those members of the audience who took the time to, to join us at these hearings. We uh, look forward to our afternoon session as well as tomorrow, certainly, and to gather the kind of input input to, uh, that this commission uh, so prizes. So with no further business before the uh, commission, uh, this hearing is adjourned.